So, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully uh, you can hear me. I hope that all the teams is set up well and I can start the lecture five from the structural biology methods. Uh, what we will talk about today is cryopter microscopy. You already had some uh, small introduction to the methods of uh, structural biology, uh, mainly about X-ray crystallography. Now I will follow with the cryopter microscopy. There will be several lectures uh, of cryopter microscopy. I will have two lectures, the first two, and uh, then uh, Eugene Novacek will follow by another three lectures, and finally. Professor Hugger Stark uh, will make two lectures of the state of the art uh, methods in cryopter microscopy. This lecture will be more like an introduction lecture to cryopter microscopy, focusing mainly on uh, how uh, uh, the microscope is constructed and how it works. Uh, just a few things at the very beginning before I uh, really start. Uh, I'm now on a single uh, screen computer, so I have only one screen on which the presentation is presented. Therefore, I cannot see if you raise your hand or use this raise your hand function in the Teams. So please, if you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself, tell me your name, it will be nice to know who you are, and the question. At the very beginning, I'm, I'm telling you there are no stupid questions, so don't be afraid to ask anything that you are interested in. If I can, I will answer it. Hopefully, there won't be too many questions that I cannot answer. So, by the very beginning, I will start uh, with this very nice graphics from Grant Jensen. He has a nice cryo microscopy course as well. And he made a kind of structural biology continuum. He's here, he is showing here how the sizes in structural biology changes and what methods we can use in structural uh, biology to study these uh, uh, features at this uh, size range. So if we start uh, at the very right one with the biggest features, those are in um, scale of millimeters, uh, usually you um, do some kind of explicit cell modeling or you can uh, use some uh, visual microscopy. Uh, when you go to the range of all cells, when you are uh, going down to micrometers, uh, here uh, the mainstream method is uh, light microscopy or fluorescent microscopy. Whereas when you are starting to decrease uh, the size and you want to increase the resolution, you start to be limited by the Rayleigh limit, which is defined by the uh, wavelength of the illuminating light. In case of uh, fluorescent microscopy, you can get down to around 200 nanometers in resolution if we are not uh, counting the super resolution methods where there's some mathematics be, uh, beyond how to improve the resolution of optical microscope. Then we can uh, as well use uh, already the uh, cryopter microscopy in the regime of cryopter tomography when we are uh, taking a look on wall cells and we are doing thin sections. We can do thin sections uh, in uh, plastic embedded or freeze embedded uh, samples or ice embedded samples. Uh, but then the most important thing that we will focus on now will be these multiprotein reactions, uh, multiprotein complexes and large, pro large protein complexes. These are the complexes that are more favorable to be studied by cryopter microscopy. Why? Because uh, the large complexes have a certain uh, amount of variability and uh, as you know in X-ray crystallography the less variable your sample is then the more likely it will crystallize. The more likely it will crystallize, the more likely you will get a regular crystal that is suitable for X-ray diffraction, and you can get a very decent diffraction data. Uh, for a cryopter microscopy, you don't need, uh, really need uh, extreme homogeneity of the sample. Nevertheless, you still uh, need reasonably uh, uh, good quality sample where uh, you can pick uh, the, the particles of your interest. Uh, if we go even uh, lower here to small proteins and domains, here really X-ray crystallography is maybe the best uh, method to use because uh, the small proteins and mainly the globular proteins are really likely to crystallize and uh, produce uh, crystals that have very high resolution diffraction. As well as here we have the NMR spectroscopy that we can use and the NMR spectroscopy itself has a great disadvantage that is really limited by the size of the molecule. So this molecule, uh, if it's very big, then uh, you have a problem in, uh, in NMR spectroscopy and more likely you will use this method for small molecules. 
If you are going to the range of atoms uh, here, you can use, of course, uh, X-ray crystallography. The problem here will be the, the limited resolution of the biological complexes. So for very small molecules, inorganic molecules, you can have very nice crystals. These crystals will diffract at a very high resolution, but for uh, proteins, this is usually not the case. So here we start to again uh, use the simulation, the molecular dynamics and computational methods. So uh, this is just a very slightly how, how cryoton microscopy compares to other methods. First of all, we have the X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography, you already know how it works. You have four lectures of uh, very detailed principles of X-ray crystallography held by Pavel Plevka, and I think that you by now are have a quite decent knowledge of X-ray crystallography and the diffraction uh, uh, of the crystals. X-ray crystallography relies on crystals. These crystals have to be ground, and this is the biggest limitation of X-ray crystallography, that we can only study molecules that are producing crystals. Nevertheless, still up to date, the X-ray crystallography is the is the gold standard of the structural biology. So usually if you uh, determine some structure by X-ray crystallography, this is uh, accepted as a structure of the molecule. Nevertheless, this is not always the case because uh, what can happen is that uh, in the crystal, you will get an alternative conformation of your molecule or your complex. This is because uh, the crystal will grow at a certain condition. This condition is not necessarily natural to the protein. So. Uh, what might happen that you uh, grow your crystal at low pH or high pH, and this is this pH is not natural for the protein, and the protein will have some alternative conformation. There have been many crystals uh, grown and many structures sold where where the structure was artificial just because the crystallization conditions somehow forced the protein to to change the conformation. Nevertheless, this is um, more or less the minority of the cases. For X-ray crystallography, you need a sample that is very pure. The, m the more pure your protein sample is, the more likely it will crystallize. You need as well a very high concentration of, of protein sample, uh, because the higher the concentration, again, the higher probability that it will crystallize, the, uh, the more conditions you can uh, try uh, for the crystallization. If you move to NMR, NMR spectroscopy, nucle uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, is relying on a nuclear spin, and this is uh, limited by uh, some atoms that have actually uh, this property. Uh, well, all the atoms have the property, but not all the atoms are measurable in the NMR uh, magnet. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do when you uh, take your samples or you are preparing your samples is usually to label your samples. In case of structural studies, you are usually labeling uh, the carbons or and the... Uh, uh, mm, nitrogens uh, of your sample to be able to, to build the backbone of the protein. Uh, not always uh, the, the measurement of the NMR spectroscopy is successful because it really relies how well your uh, sample behaves and how well you get separated the so-called peaks that you then have to assign to the backbone of your protein. It's just quite tedious work. Nevertheless, this uh, puts a little bit the price up on, on your expressions because you need to have modified media uh, with an isotopes of, uh, of uh, uh, carbon. And uh, also, uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, harder to, to achieve proper concentration. Although now, nowadays, uh, also lower concentrations are suitable for NMR uh, spectroscopy. Uh, a lot less than for X-ray crystallography, but still a higher concentration, higher signal, most likely you will see your structure. For cryo microscopy, the only limitation you have is that your sample has to be visible in the cryo microscope. So if you can see your samples, see your sample, then it's m most likely you can collect your data. It doesn't necessarily mean that you install the structure, but uh, the first thing that you will really know, need to know when you take the first look on your sample in the electron microscope where you see it. There's an anecdote that uh, says that if you don't see the particles, they are not there. So this limits the crime so far to a bigger complexes. Uh, what bigger complex is? Uh, uh, the bigger complex nowadays for cry electron microscope is anything uh, about 100 kilodaltons. Although there are some publications that will 
tell you that uh, there's always all the structure of a 60 kilodalton protein or 40 kilodalton protein. These are more like uh, the rare cases. However, this is also an advantage of the cryoton microscopy because cryoton microscopy can be used for studying uh, complexes. You can uh, study huge complexes, and because usually the biomolecular complexes are not uh, extremely stable or they are more flexible, they are not very suitable for X ray crystallography. If you try to crystallize a ribosome, you have to be really careful by the crystallization conditions. You have to be very careful not to disturb the crystallization plates. Whereas in cryo-EM, you take your ribosome, freeze it, collect your data, and, and you can reconstruct the right way. It's quite a big thing, the ribosome is almost 28 nanometers. So, uh, if we move more, uh, we can see that in 2017, uh, a Nobel Prize award was given to three scientists. It was Jacques Dubuchet on the left, Joachim Frank on the right, and Richard Henderson, uh, Joachim Frank in the middle, and Richard Henderson on the right. These three guys had some major contributions for cryo microscopy. Now the question is, why really took to the, the year 2017 to award these three people for cryo microscopy methods? Jacques Dubochet already did the vitrification process in 1980s. Uh, Joachim Frank and, uh, uh, and Richard Hernesser started with the t theories of the image formation and uh, image reconstruction in the 1970s. They, they followed up with it and they developed, uh, they also predicted at the time what will be the theoretical uh, limit of the resolution of, uh, of the electron microscopy and uh, followed by cryoton microscopy. Uh, Joachim Frank also uh, made a, some of the first methods for the, for the uh, electron microscopic reconstructions. The reason why this was not really uh, awarded earlier was the so-called resolution level revolution. What the resolution revolution means? The cryo microscopy uh, started as so-called blobology. So what you can see here is a beta galactose uh, complex where on the left side you can see a electron density map or the electrostatic potential uh, map of low, low resolution, whereas on the right, you can see of a high resolution. Uh, up to a certain date, which was uh, a few years ago, we can only have a very low resolution data or very, very low resolution maps out from cryoton microscopy. This was also called blobology. So this was the, these were the times where people were laughing at you that cryo-EM is not really a structural method. So, Maybe you can see some complexes, but the resolution of this complex is uh, very pure. And if you want to solve it somehow, then at least you need to know the structure of the monomers, for example, by X-ray crystallography. And then you can fit uh, your molecules right into this uh, poor density map. Whereas these maps were so poor of density that you can fit anything everywhere and everything anywhere there. So there were lots of discussions if it was properly fitted, if, uh, uh, if it's really representing what we, we are looking for. Then what happened, it was called a resolution revolution. And the resolution revolution started at around 2011 when the direct electron detectors were introduced. Uh, the direct electron detectors really revolutionized the uh, cryoton microscopy because uh, we pushed the resolution from, let's say, 20 30 angstroms down to 3, 2, and nowadays we have a 1.20 something, 1.2 angstrom resolution. That's the best. Nevertheless, I have to say that uh, what we can do to today routinely is uh, something between 2 and 3 angstrom resolution, which is uh, quite a nice resolution uh, if we compare it 10 years ago, uh, or let's say more than 10 years ago, uh, it was 10 times worse. So, uh, what's the principle or, or what's the basics of the cryoton microscopy? That's the microscope. So. If you want to do a cryo microscopy, you need a cryo microscope. And that's not a cheap thing, but as well not an extremely expensive thing. At the very beginning, these uh, Titan Cryos microscopes that we have here uh, on the cryo core facility, these were the most expensive microscopes in the world, which they still are. But if you compare this microscope, uh, which, for example, synchrotron, the price of a synchrotron, where you can uh, collect high resolution and very nice quality data for the X ray crystallography, then it's actually very cheap. And what we see nowadays is that more and more facilities are getting equipped with these microscopes. So 
Uh, five years ago, a lot of people uh, were coming here just to measure the data because they don't have other access to the microscope, whereas nowadays they bought their own microscope and they are measuring the data at home. So uh, what you can see on the, uh, on the left here, uh, this is a character microscope Titan Cryos, which was a state-of-the-art microscope uh, like five years ago. Still Titan Cryos is a state-of-the-art microscope. They just make some uh, improvements and innovations. So uh, while this is a generation, the second generation of uh, Titan Cryos, nowadays there's the fourth generation of Titan Cryos. Uh, well, actually, if you take a look on it, uh, you can see that it really doesn't look like a microscope. It looks like a black box. Or a, or a black striped white box. Inside this box, there's the microscope. There, there's a microscope that we are really used to as like a microscopist. So what you can see inside is a, is a column uh, where the electrons are passing through your sample and forming the image on the detector. Uh, this electron microscope has 300 kilovolts, and uh, I think that uh, it will be very nice to show you how actually this microscope works. So this will be the very beginning of our journey. This, this will explain you how, a cry, uh, how an electron microscope, not, not only a cry electron microscope, but any electron microscope works. So, how them compares to optical microscope? This uh, is a very interesting question, which is very easily answered by, by the following slide. An optical microscope has a source of photons. Well, you can see here, the photons are coming here. They are reflected from this mirror, going through the condenser system or the illumination system. Here is your sample. They are going through the sample. The sample has to be transparent. If you are using not a, uh, uh, a normal optical transmission microscope, then your sample has to be transparent, which is usually the case when you, when you have such small things. They are usually transparent to the photons, uh, at least at visible light. Then, you have the objective lens. This objective lens takes in focus and magnify. You have the projection system where you have additional lens which magnify more. And then there's a detector. The detector actually here is your eye. So eyelashes. So I think the detector is one of the most beautiful detectors in nature. But this detector actually is useless for electron microscopy. It's only useful for, uh, for visible light microscopy. So let's take a look how an electron microscope looks like. It's uh, very similar. So what we got here is almost an electron microscope, or almost the schematics of an electron microscope. So an electron microscope is virtually just a microscope that is turned upside down. And the main difference is that the source of light is not light, is not, are not photons, but the source is there an electron source. So you are illuminating your samples by electrons. You have an illumination system consisting of, uh, again, some condenser lens, and uh, then you have your sample, which has to be electron transparent, objective lens, projection system, and the detector which, of course, in this case, cannot be your, your bare eye because your bare eye is not sensitive to electron flux. Well, uh, the main disadvantage here uh, in comparison with optical microscopy is a sample. The sample has to be electron transparent. This is a very important part. You can do transmission electron microscopy, not scanning electron microscopy, that's a different method. Transmission electron microscopy only on electron transparent uh, matter. And the electron transparent matter start to be transparent from around, let's say, 500 nanometers. That's really the maximum, more like the 200 nanometer thickness is transparent for the electrons. And still, it's uh, very dark stuff inside the microscope. So the, the thinner your sample is, the better for the electrons, because the electrons really like to interact with the matter. They really like to interact with your bi biological stuff, and as, as well, they will damage your biological stuff. So that's, an, again, a disadvantage in comparison with the photons. You can take the photons, <coughs> illuminate your sample for a very long time, and virtually nothing will happen. In case of electron microscopy, you take your sample, illuminate it with electrons, and electrons start to damage your sample. Virtually, they will, they will burn your sample. So uh, to make them better schematics, not only like an inverted optical microscope from the Wikipedia, uh, I find a very nice picture of an electron microscope that is not inside a big box, 
this, these are the old times uh, where the electromicroscopes look like an electromicroscope actually. A very big uh, column of, of the electron beam here and the detector right here was again something where you could use your own eyes. Actually, you were not looking at the electrons, you were looking on a fluorescent screen and uh, this fluorescent screen was converting uh, the, the electrons into visible photons. We will get to this when we will talk about the uh, detectors. What you have on the right side is a schematics how this looks like actually inside. If you take a look on this, it's, it's quite a complex stuff. And by the end of this course, you will really know what the van Helt, what the anode, what the gun deflectors, objective stigmator, diffractor stigmator, intermediate lines are, and why they are there, how you can use them. Now, uh, this is what we will start. This is what we will start our journey with. We will explain how this electron microscope works. In this first lecture, we will mainly focus on uh, how the lens work, how the stigmator work, uh, how, how the electrons are actually generated. Later, the next uh, uh, lecture, we will focus on the image formation and how the image uh, uh, is actually affected by the small point spread function in the uh, electron microscopy method. So, we have a very nice column. Uh, I suggest that we will pass from very top to very bottom of this uh, microscopic column. So, move it to the left and let's start with the electron gun. The electron gun, this is the very top part uh, of the microscope. So, to be able to visualize some stuff with, uh, with electrons, we need to get these electrons. We need to generate these electrons. The question is how to generate electrons. Uh, one of the ways how we can do it is that we, uh, we take a tungsten fil filament, here's a tungsten filament, and we heat it up. We actually heat it up by a current. This is very similar uh, to light bulb in the, let's call it ancient times, where you have light bulbs with, with tungsten filaments. You switch on the power and the current was passing through your filament and the filament was heated up. While the filament is heated up, the very tip of the filament uh, is get very hot and when it's very hot the electrons are passing through this tip very fast. So at a certain point the electrons from this tip might detach. They can really detach because of the kinetic energy. So they are passing all the way uh, this filament and at a certain point they are detaching from the tip and they are spreading to the environment. Well, as we already told, uh, the electrons are likely to interact with some matter, so you want to have your environment as uh, matter-free as possible. Therefore, you have a very high vacuum here. You have a very high vacuum in the gun, and in all the microscope is a very high vacuum. Now, what we have here is a Van Holt cup. The Van Holt cup is a piece of metal cup, very nicely polished piece of metal cup, which has a very small aperture at the end. Now, the tip itself is heated by current and it is kept at minus 300 kilowatts. We are speaking now about the 300 kilowatt microscope, so it is uh, set at a potential of minus 300 kilowatts. Whereas this Van Halt here is uh, at a, a, a lower uh, or, or lower or high potential. So here we have actually some uh, some resistor that keeps this at let's say uh, some delta of 295 kilovolts, let's say. So what will happen that here will be a difference in, uh, in potentials and the electrons will be attracted to this uh, one halt and how they are spreading into here in, uh, into the space, they are somehow getting focused and passing through the van halt. Now this is still not enough. These, these electrons are not really convergent and they are not very uh, uh, nice homogenic. So what we have more is that we have here an anode. The anode is set at zero kilovolts. So actually the difference in potential here from the very top of the tip of the filament to here 
uh, to the anode actually is 300 kilowatts. It's a it's it's a step. Here, here I will show you. It's, it's a step of uh, uh, of uh, potential, which will force the electrons to pass through this anode. Sorry, pass through this anode and make an electron beam. Here. You see, the zero, zero kilovolt is done by grounding the instrument. All the electron microscopes has to be very well grounded, so that you really uh, have a high tension in between the tip and the ground. The high tension uh, is generated uh, by a high tension power supply, and this power supply is uh, uh, really a big tank uh, that's uh, filled with some inertial gas. and. Uh, and that's all <laughs> I would say. Uh, well, I will show you more that actually what you usually see in the in the books, this anode here is not only a single plate. The anode itself is usually shown as a single plate to show you that there is a difference in of 300 or 200 or 100 kilowatt depending on the microscope in between the tip and the anode itself. But actually to make uh, this beam more coherent and make the beam more uh, more homogeneous, we have a stack of anodes. And this stack of anodes is built the way that every step of this stack has an increment in the potential. So at the very lowest stack is uh, grounded to the zero. Then we have 30, minus 30 kilowatts, minus 60 kilowatts, minus 90, and so on, up to minus 270 kilowatts. So you can see that the electrons coming from here, where this part, where the filament is held at minus 300 kilovolt potential, the electrons actually passes very fast through this gap and forming a very coherent beam. If you want to take a look how this actually look like in, uh, in the reality, this is, uh, I found it on Amazon, they're actually selling this microscope. This is actually a gun uh, of an FEI microscope, and what you can see here are these rings. These rings are ex actually the rings of the accelerator stack. So what sometimes might happen that uh, inside the microscope you have a very a large vacuum, but this vacuum uh, is still containing some particles, some contaminants, let's say. And these contaminants may build up on the plates yeah, so they are gradually building up on these electrostatic plates and they are growing. And at a certain point they grow so, f so far that actually there will be a discharge in between these two plates and your microscope will shut off. So to avoid this, you have to, from time to time to, to so-called condition your, your gun. Uh, so uh, it's done by baking out the gun. It's actually heating up this part of the gun and rising the uh, voltage, rising the potential difference in between the very bottom and the very top to a higher voltage actually that you are using for your, uh, uh, for your imaging. So if it is 300 kilovolts that you are usually using, then for conditioning you will use uh, 330, let's say. You will keep your microscope for a while at this uh, higher voltage and then you go back and you should get a very stable gradient of, uh, of potential from the very top, from the filament to the valley bottom. Next, uh, we will talk about what this filament actually is, how does it look like. Uh, as I told you, this was an example of a Wolfram or, or a tungsten filament, but there are multiple different kinds of filaments. Uh, the most known or the most ancient one is the tungsten filament. The tungsten filament together with the LAB6 filament is a thermionic filament. The thermionic filament means that you need to heat up this filament to a certain temperature to be able to get out the electrons out from it. So for these filaments you really need to heat them up, uh, up to 200, uh, 2000 degrees centigrade or for the LAB6 a little bit lower and then uh, the Van Helt cup of course attracts these uh, electrons and the anode will accelerate them. That's true uh, for all of these. The LAB6 filament, uh, sorry, uh, just to show you how it looks like, it uh, looks like this. This is actually a tungsten filament. 
uh, there is no scale bar, which is a major concern for structural biologists. I would say that uh, this distance here is around one and a half to two centimeters, just to let you know how big this is, it's around one and a half centimeter. Uh, and the only part that is from tungsten is this small part. This is this is from tungsten. They have different shapes. This is a uh, shape uh, typical for a geomicroscope. It has a very sharp tip, but uh, still, uh, this is one of the filaments that uh, are has the worst properties, I would say. If you want to get to a better filament, you would use the LA, LAB6 filament. Uh, it's a, a lanthanum borate. It's a single crystal here. So you can see here are some holders that hold the tungsten filament. Here, <coughs> instead of tungsten filament, you are holding a single crystal of LAB6. The very tip of this crystal is polished to a very fine tip. So the sharper this tip actually is here, the better it is for your, uh, uh, for your electron emission. Because the electrons that's coming from the same place, from, from uh, uh, spatially uh, the same tip, or, or uh, uh, same location from the tip, will have the highest coherence. Uh, the drawback of the LAB6 filament is that actually the lifetime of LAB6 filament is not that high and gradually it degrades and the tip becomes more and more dull. Now, we are getting from the thermionic filaments to the field emission filaments. These filaments are now exclusively used in high microscopes. So any of these two thermionic filaments are not used in high microscopes. They are very uh, often used in in a lower acceleration voltage microscopes, I would say 100 kilovolt uh, microscope or even 200 kilovolt uh, microscope, but nowadays if you are buying a high-end microscope uh, or a cryopto microscope, almost certainly it will be equipped with a field emission gun. How the field emission gun works? The field emission gun again has a kind of filament and on the filament there is welded a very sharp tip. If you take a look in a, uh, in a scanning electron microscope, you have here a very fine tip of tungsten, again, and this tip is extremely sharp. It's a lot sharper than its LAB6 crystal, uh, and as well as here, there's a, a small bulk, and this is uh, from zirconium oxide, it is making it more stable. And what you can see up here, it is a typical filament, a Schottky filament for the uh, for the hot field emission gun or warm field emission gun. There are two kinds of field emission guns. One is the cold field emission gun, the other one is the hot field emission gun. The difference in between them is whether this uh, tip is heated to 25 degrees centigrade or 1500 degrees centigrade. You can see that we are still using a, a tungsten tip here, but we are heating your, our uh, tungsten tip to a lot lower uh, temperature than in case of uh, thermionic tungsten filament. That's because now we are uh, using a field, an electrical field, to extract the electrons out from the very tip of the tip. So instead of the Wehmnelt, we have here another anode. We call this anode 1, the anode 2. And anode 2 is very common to the all other filaments. This anode 1 is the extraction anode. This extraction anode is held at around for uh, in a potential difference of 4000 uh, volts for example and this field that is generated by this anode is actually extracting the electrons out from the tip so the question is only if it's extracting from a hot tip or the cold tip uh, let's uh, compare them so the sources uh, of electron and their pro uh, properties. The thermionic guns, we told that uh, the field emission guns are superior to thermionic ones. Nevertheless, the thermionic guns are still used. Uh, the cheapest one is the tungsten filament. I already told you about the problem of tungsten filament is that actually it has the lowest brightness. If you take a look in this table, you will see that the brightness uh, of the tungsten filament is 10 times lower than actually uh, brightness of LAB6 filament. The good thing about uh, tungsten and LNB6 filament in case, uh, is that they are interchangeable. So if you virtually want to upgrade your microscope, uh, it's very likely that you can upgrade your tungsten filament to an LAB6 filament and you get uh, 10 times more uh, brightness 
Nevertheless, this is very, not very often done because people who have microscopy or tungsten filament, they are usually used to it and they are using uh, the microscope for, uh, uh, for measurements that really don't require very high brightness. The LIB6 filament has a higher brightness uh, and a less energy spread. This is also a very important part. The, the tungsten filament actually has the most spread of electro, uh, of the electro energy. Uh, here we see that there's an energy spread of three electron volts. The three electron volts means that actually when we extract the uh, electrons out from the tip and we accelerate them uh, to 300,000 volts, uh, usually for tungsten film it's uh, less, uh, the energy spread uh, is plus minus three electron volts. In case of LAB6, the spread was a difference in the, in the highest energy and the lowest energy is one and a half electron volt. And now when you go to the field emission gun, you can see that here it is dramatically dropped. So that's the, the main advantage of the field emission gun. The LAB6 filament has another uh, bad property, and this is usually why the people who are using tungsten filament are not changing it for LAB6 filament if they don't need to, is the lower lifetime. So while the LAB6 filament has a higher brightness, it over the time, lifetime of the filament gradually decreases. And it decreases to, uh, to the point where you have to replace it. They cost more than the tungsten filament. And uh, it, of course, every replacement of these filaments is some downtime for a microscope. The good thing about thermionic uh, filaments is that if you are very well skilled microscopist, then you can change these filaments by yourself. It's not very hard to, uh, to disassemble the microscope and change these uh, filaments uh, uh, and we've done it routinely. Whereas in the ca case of these filaments in the field emission column, uh, this is usually not possible. You have to ask for professional help, for professional service that they will uh, uh, exchange it. And uh, where, whereas the thermic filament, the exchange of the thermic filament will take a day or two, a field emission gun may take a week. The field emission gun already I told you about that there are two kinds of field emission guns, the, the hot field emission, the warm one, or the cold. Uh, uh, nowadays the hot one is used by uh, Thermo Fisher, previously FEI or Philips, and the cold field emission gun is used by GEO. However, this is not exclusive. Uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of both of these. <coughs> I'm sorry both of these uh, systems. So both of these systems has a very high brightness. You can see that it's it's thousand times bright, uh, brighter than the LA Bay 6. In structural biology this is usually not a key factor or the limiting factor because uh, too high brightness will burn our sample. But nevertheless uh, for other microscopists in the material sciences this is a key factor. So they really need the field emission guns just because of uh, uh, of the brightness. Both of these are bright enough. However, the lifetime of the war or of the of the thermal one, the shot key, is lower. This is again very similar to the LAB6 or the tungsten filament that because of the heating, the very tip will degrade the tip of the tip will degrade and while it's getting more and more dull, the energy spread and uh, as well the coherence of the beam will degrade. Also the uh, uh, the brightness will degrade over the time. The cold fag doesn't have this problem. It has a lo longer uh, lifetime. However, it can be really easily uh, contaminated and the stability of the beam is variating over the time. So uh, while in the for the shot key you have a constant flux of the beam uh, for the cold fag, you have some kind of cycles where the beam has, is more intense or less intense. And this, for us structural biologists, where we really care about the dose that your sample is getting, is quite a drawback. So, if you want to work with it, the, uh, the manufacturer has to be aware of the cycles and they, they have to manage it to when to actually measure and, and when, to, when to recondition your fag to be in an acceptable range of the flux, electron flux. Uh, well, the main advantage of cold fag over the, over the thermal fag is, uh, is the energy spread. If you take a look here, you can see that the energy spread of, uh, 
of a cold uh, fag is 0.3 electron volts, whereas of, of the thermal fag is 0.7, more than twice of it. This can be uh, corrected by some monochromator to get this uh, for the thermal fag uh, lower as well. Uh, nevertheless, uh, usually in the structural biology we are not using this monochromator because it is expensive and gives us a very low advantage. Uh, the very last column, what you can see here, the vacuum column, uh, also shows you the demands on the microscope that is needed uh, in, uh, in the terms of vacuum system. For the tungsten and LAB6 filaments, uh, the vacuum that you need to get, I guess this is in pascals or tors, uh, is a lot lower than in case of field emission gas. And the cold fag in this is exceptional, it needs to tend to the power of minus 10. And this puts an extra uh, expenses on the on the vacuum system as well on the build on the microscope. So this is the reason also why you simply cannot equip your old microscope with a new field emission gun and think that you will have a much better results. <clears throat> so the electron beam has few properties that's uh, good to know. First of all, beam coherence. The beam coherence is uh, uh, maybe spatial coherence. The spatial coherence is how uh, well the beam is defined spatially. Uh, this, uh, this means that uh, if you have a tip from where you are extracting your, uh, your electrons, how close this source of the electrons actually was when, when the electrons were extracted. The sharper the tip is, then spatially more coherent your beam will be. And that's temporal coherence. The temporal coherence will be uh, the coherence of the beam in the terms of the energy spread. The less the energy spread is, the more beneficial for you it is. Uh, as we told, this is usually uh, achieved by the, uh, by the thermal fag or the cold fag. Wavelength of the electron at 300 kilovolt acceleration. So you accelerate your electron by a field of 300 kilovolts. Uh, I was not putting here all the, uh, all the equations. How can we calculate actually the speed of the electron, uh, which is given by this electric field, but it will uh, get very close to 0 0.76, three quarters of the speed of the light. A C means the speed of the light. So we are getting very close to the speed of the light. And maybe you remember that uh, Albert always said that when you are getting close to the speed of the light, you cannot use the conventional physics, you have to use the relativistic physics. Actually, at this point, at 0 0.76 times the, the speed of the light, we already have to use the relativistic equations to describe uh, the speed and the movements of the electron. And uh, we, we then can calculate that at 300,000 kilovolts, the, electron, uh, the, the wavelength of the electron is around two picometers. It's, it's 1.96 or something like that. So if we go to nanometers, uh, pico to nano, it's uh, 0 0.02. And we go to angstroms, it's 0 0.02 angstrom. And we know that, uh, for example, for X-rays, this is 0 0.1. So we are, again, 10 times uh, lower, which is good for us in terms of resolution. But what we will find out that actually the wavelength of the electron is not really the limiting factor of, uh, of the electron microscope or the resolution of the electron microscope. We will get to it what will be the limiting factor. Nevertheless, still, these uh, high acceleration voltage uh, uh, Microscopes produce a very coherent beam uh, with, a, with a very short wavelength that is very beneficial for us. Every electron has a magnetic momentum. This magnetic momentum is important for us because because of the magnetic momentum, the uh, electron will behave in the electromagnetic field. It will behave because of his charge, and then it will behave because of his magnetic momentum. The electric part, the magnetic part of the field, will interact with the with the electron, and this will give us the possibility that the electron actually can be focused. This is a very great advantage of the electron. This is actually why electron microscope work. works. Uh, just think about it. Uh, why there are no X-ray microscopes? So X-ray crystallography is great. You get diffractions, but why there are not 
X-ray microscopes. I have to tell you that they are really working on uh, X-ray microscopes. They have some some prototypes, but the resolution is nowhere close enough to electron microscopes, and that's because they don't have lens that can actually focus the X-ray beam into in the cosmic spot. This is not the case of electrons. Uh, with electrons, you can work almost the same with light, with a few exceptions that you have to modify your uh, your optics. But we will talk about it later. In case of X-rays, it's very hard to find some material because the X-rays are interacting uh, very weakly with the material. So it's very hard to find the material that will actually bend the X-rays and uh, make it possible to focus them. The disadvantage of electron is the opposite of the X-rays. What we already thought that the X-rays are not, not extremely interacting with the matter. You are, they are really flying through you and you can see your, your image in, uh, in the detector. In case of electrons, the electrons actually are highly interacting with the matter and highly interacting with the biological stuff. And this is the problem of, uh, as well, the small penetration of the electrons. So we have a thick sample. Almost all the electrons will be kind of absorbed by this sample because all the electrons will be scattered and interacting with the matter with an, in a non-elastic scattering. What non-elastic scattering is, we will get there later. So, <clears throat> we told about that the electron has a magnetic momentum. So now uh, what I will show you is how this magnetic momentum can be used with something very simple called deflectors. <clears throat> Why doing deflectors? I will explain you with, with a very easy uh, example. This is only one of the deflectors that we have in the microscope, but uh, later we will walk through all the microscope and show where there are other deflectors and how they are used. Now we will uh, uh, talk about uh, the deflector of the gun beam or the gun shift, gun tilt deflectors. I'm showing this, these, these parts. And the reason for that, that these deflectors are here is that the electron microscope is a very complex instrument and it's very hard to build this instrument without any tolerances that would affect uh, the electron microscope itself. So, uh, in our case, you, we are talking about micrometers, nanometers, or lateral distances, and simply by the current machinery, you cannot produce a part that is big enough and uh, has a very small tolerances. So you simply cannot make an electron microscope that has a tolerance of nanometers in the mechanical parts. So what might happen is that you install your gun. We told about that, yet, that this is the gun. You take the gun, you, you install it in a microscope, and you find out that your gun is shifted. Actually, the gun itself is off axis. This is the optical axis of the microscope. And when we would just spread our electrons, it would not pass through the cone. The other thing what should might happen, this is of course a little bit exaggerated, so it's not tilted that much, but the, the gun may be a little bit tilted as well. So actually, again, what's happening is that it's not shifted laterally, but it's tilted on, uh, on the axis, and because of this tilt, again, the electrons won't hit our cone, and they're getting dissipated in the, uh, in the environment. And what's usually happening is that we have a shifted and a tilted gun. This is, this is the life. This is how, how it simply works and uh, we simply cannot uh, do nothing with this because of uh, the current um, engineering. And I, I think that there will be no real uh, reason to extremely improve this at the cost of expenses because we can correct this. The easiest way, uh, well, the easiest way how we think it, this would be corrected is that you simply take your gun and rotate it. So many of the people think that uh, when we are talking about uh, beam shift correction and beam tilt correction, that actually there are some uh, micromotors that are shifting or tilting the gun mechanically, moving here or there and twisting it left and right, but actually this is not the case. It works a little bit differently and it works the following way. <clears throat> the electron can be manipulated by the magnetic field. So if we have here some coils and we put some electricity in, in, into these coils, 
then we can affect actually the electron that is passing in between these two coils the way that we can deflect the electron. We can deflect the electron to the right side, to the left side, we can deflect the electron more, we can deflect the electron less. Let's see what's happening. The electron beam is getting from the uh, uh, from the gun and it's hitting the plane of the uh, beam deflector the first beam deflector, first pair of beam, beam deflector and these beam deflectors are actually tilting the beam so the, here is actually some some tilt angle uh, that, uh, that the beam deflectors induce to the incoming beam and while there are another set of beam deflectors these beam deflectors will tilt the beam again if you take a look here we tilted the beam, beam again by, by a certain angle. These two angles actually here are the same. And what we've got is that we shifted our beam from this position to this position. So if you think about the image at the, uh, at the previous slide, then if our gun is actually off center here and the center of the optics is here, then we just need to deflect the beam uh, with the beam deflectors, electron beam deflectors, and you get it right on the optical axis. Let's take a look on the beam tilt. The beam tilt, again, our beam comes to the first pair of the, the deflectors. It is deflected and bent by, by a certain uh, amount of angle. And then there's a second pair of the beam deflectors. And this angle actually is different. This angle is uh, now not equal to the first uh, beam deflector angle. It's a little bit uh, smaller. It can be higher as well than, than simply what would happen that we would deflect the beam here. But we can be even, even more smaller and we would deflect the beam here. So using these coils we did a beam tilt. Now if you think about that uh, this beam might be not uh, vertical but the beam incoming beam might be something that's coming like this and then we are deflecting it and then we are deflecting it again this is what might happen that that our beam will become actually vertical and that's what we did we uh, already compensated for the gun tilt and if you want to compensate for gun tilt and gun shift we will use both of these approaches the interesting point of this approach is that there is no difference in the coils for the beam shift and the beam tilt deflection. Actually, there are no two sets of coils, like one set for beam shift and one set for beam tilt. There's only one set of coils, one set of uh, two pairs, one pair, the second pair. Actually, what you are doing is that you are regulating what will be the current on these coils and these coils, and that's how you are affecting your uh, the deflection of your beam. And that's how you can define whether actually the set setup of uh, the beam will uh, only shift it or will only tilt it or will shift and tilt it at the same time <clears throat> you can think about it that here we can as well do something like uh, we are getting here and then getting here and then getting here the beam here would be tilted and shifted as well so what we want to achieve is that we want to be sure that actually these deflectors are doing what we want them to do. So we want to tune this, uh, uh, these deflectors the way that they will have some pivot point where, where around this pivot point they will turn this, uh, these beam deflections. And the setup of this pivot point should, should assure us that when we want to do just a tilt then we actually will get a tilt without any shift and we, when we want to have a shift then we will have a shift without any tilt and of course if this will work then certainly the shift with tilt or tilt with shift would, should work as well now <clears throat> we will slowly get into the uh, major part of the electron microscope and that's the optical uh, fr from the optical system and the electromagnetic lens for the clarity I will start with a, a 
classic optic lens that all of you well known because if I would explain all this uh, with electromagnetic lens that would be a little bit uh, harder to understand. Nevertheless, uh, later we will see how an electromagnetic lens uh, look like. Uh, it doesn't matter how it look like. We can always uh, represent it exactly the same way like we are representing uh, an optical lens. Like we have an, uh, a piece of hardware here. Here it is glass. Actually for electron microscope it cannot be glass because the glass is not transparent for electrons. At first we will uh, define some uh, very basic, basic uh, statements and that here we have the optical axis uh, and he here we have uh, some source and this is the result of, uh, of the uh, of the rays passing through the, uh, the lens. So the lens actually are converging all the beams diverging from the side from the one side of the lens they converge it on the other side of the lens. The important part is that the rays that are getting through the central of the optical axis they are remaining on that. The or rays that are passing anywhere elsewhere they get bent the way that they focus in the focal point. I was thinking about whether to explain how this really works in, in the case of lens, how uh, what's happening inside this uh, magic box of, of the glass lens. This can be uh, explained by the uh, wave characteristic of the light. So you can think about the light that it's a wave that's getting up here, then changing its uh, uh, f uh, its frequency inside uh, uh, the lens and then it's getting back the frequency outside and what happens that in this point actually the faces are all adding up constructively. This is very similar to what you already heard for example in a diffraction uh, and uh, the Bragg's law that uh, you can see a spot only there where the waves adds up constructively. So you can think about it that the, the, the faces of all these waves that are coming here will have the same phase shift in this point and therefore it adds up constructively whereas in any other spot here, here and here would not add up constructively. This is one explanation. Another explanation would be that if we would consider the properties of the light as, uh, uh, as particles and these people would uh, just uh, calculate the statistics that how likely it is that actually the focal point will be here, here, here and here. And they would end up that the most likely point where the focal point will be is here. So there are many ways how, how to explain the lens. We can explain it as well with the, with the refraction properties of the glass and the speed of light inside and outside of the glass. Uh, I will let it on you how you like to uh, explain it and um, maybe to, to look up more closely but we are more interested in, on, in these two things that I, I pinpointed out that the rays that are going through the center are actually unaffected, the rays that are going off the center of the optical axis are affected. So let's take a, an example. Let's have an object on the very left side. Here we have an object. And from this object, actually, we can think about this point, the very top point, oh, sorry, the very top point here, and think about all the rays that are coming out from this top point. And all these rays would hit at a certain point the lens, and the lens would somehow affect these points and get to some focal point. This is how the lens work. I'm now just been pointing out two possibilities how this could work that we will take one ray we will take a ray that's actually coming from the very top of this arrow and passing through the center of the optical axis to the center of the lane uh, uh, of the lens you can clearly see that this ray will become unaffected we already told about it that this is simply how the lens behaves then we will take another the, the other one will be a very special kind, the, the kind that the, the ray will be parallel with the optical axis. So actually what will happen that the ray will travel to the lens 
and then it will be bent by the lens and hit our, let's call this, image plane. Now let's take another, let's take, a, take another point out from our object. Our object has, has in, in, in fact infinite amount of points, but we will just take few of these points and to see what will happen with them with uh, the rays coming out from this point are actually passing through the lens. So again we have a, a, a ray that's going to, uh, across the center of the optical axis and then another one that's uh, parallel uh, with the optical axis and all the other ones that uh, are not showing are actually there and what's actually happening that all of them are focusing or getting in focus inside this uh, at this point so you can see that at, uh, at a certain distance from the lens we have a plane where all these ray, uh, rays are getting in a in a one spot the last one, we will take the point at the very bottom here, and actually what uh, you see here that the ray that is passing through the center of the optics, of the, of the optic lens, is the same uh, ray that's actually parallel with the optical axis. So here we don't have two, we have only one. And this point is actually shown here. So what we get out, we will get uh, the magnified image of the object. So here we have the object, here's the image of the object, and this magnified image of the object is actually bigger. Okay, maybe that's why it is magnified. Uh, it could become smaller as well, it, it depends on the properties of the lens. Well, there's an, uh, some interesting part. Here is a point, if you take a look here, you will see that all the rays that were incoming to the, uh, to the lens parallel with the optical axis are crossing in the single point at the optical axis. This we call the focal point. You can imagine something similar when you take your magnifying glass. I guess some of you played with it as children or even as adults. And the rays coming out from the sun, actually the sun is so far from here that we can assume that all these rays that are coming from the, uh, from the sky are parallel. And this, uh, and this parallel, if we take this parallel rays and we converge or, or focus them with a lens, we will get to one point where we actually can ignite, for example, uh, a paper. This point is actually the focal point. You, uh, of course, can think about this as well, the way that you are holding your magnifier glass and you are getting closer or further uh, from the magnifier glass looking through it and at a certain point you will see that the image is getting you know, they're getting closer, it's getting deformed, deformed, deformed and you get to some point where you see that this image is again starting to cha change the opposite way. This is when you cause, uh, pass through this focal point. This is the back focal point. Back, back focal, so called back focal plane. This is the front focal plane. So, another thing is that we have here two uh, distances. We have the object distance, we have the distance of the object from the central plane of the lens, and then we have the image distance. If the image distance actually is uh, larger than the object distance, then our lens are magnifying. And the ratio in between these two, the image distance uh, divided by the object distance, will give us the magnification, magnif uh, magnification ratio, uh, uh, ratio. So uh, the magnification of the lens. Whereas here, up here, we have a focal distance, and the focal distance actually can be calculated by adding the one over the length of the object distance plus one over the length of the image distance. This is the property of the, this is a constant property of the lens. Now, what might happen? So, what might happen is that we have our imaging plane and we will move our imaging plane out from this position where we have a nicely focused image or, or the nicely focused points of our object so we can imagine that all these points here on the object 
are actually focused here so we can construct indefinite uh, amount of these constructions that we have here and then, then we'll, we'll constructively add up and form the image of the object then what might happen is that we get a little bit closer to our uh, to our lens what happens now now we see that the, the rays are actually not really adding up into a single point these uh, rays are actually crossing our sorry crossing our image plane at two points yeah this is what we call under focus <clears throat> now it's uh, very uh, important to uh, describe that uh, every uh, manipulation that gets our object image out of focus is called defocus so if you apply some defocus in the microscope that means that we get our object out of focus of the image plane uh, the out of focus is not telling you anything about whether your image is under focused or the, the defocus is not telling you if it's under focused or over focused because then on the next example we can show what will happen if we move our plane to the other side if we move our plane to the other side we actually get to the over focus the over focus is, looks very similar in terms of this visualization that uh, we will get two points for every ray but uh, visually in the microscope the image will look different so we cannot interchange the under focus image with the uh, with the over focus image they, they are two different images and when you are talking about it i applied some defocus you have to tell the amount of the defocus either as a positive or negative number whereas a negative number uh, denotes an under focus and a positive number an over focus or you have to uh, say that uh, the images were collected at an under focus of 3 microns that actually means that the focus minus 3 uh, this is just to let you know because some people simply think that they say that oh, we made our image at defocus uh, 3 uh, microns they think that it means minus 3 actually not but uh, in majority of uh, cryopter microscopy or almost always we are using under focused images uh, in the image how the image is constructed we'll, we will talk about the next time and you will see why we are not using in focus images we are, are always use out of focus images and usually or almost always we are using under focused images in the cryopter microscopy so <coughs> uh, You've seen how we represented our lens as uh, a projection system where we projected our uh, feature, our arrow, from the left side to the right side. But there is an alternative way uh, how we can show lenses. We will show here that we have a single point at the very beginning and the single point has a property that it lies on the optical axis. So actually the other point its image will lie on the optical axis as well and it should be focused in the focal plane this is usually what's what's happening so this kind of representation is in fact an alternative representation how we can show the effect of the lens i think this is understandable therefore as well as well we can show that how in this representation an under focus will look like and how an over focus will look like so under focus will get closer to the lens, our focus will get further from the lens. And of course, it will be never in the focal point. Yeah? Here's the focal point, and the focal point is here, and our image plane is further or uh, closer to, uh, to the focal point. This is just to let you know uh, that previously we just take two rays out from one point. Now we are taking many rays from the one point, as well as we are choosing a very special point that's located on the optical axis and this is how we can see how nicely uh, uh, the rays converge or later you will see how they can diverge as well so uh, now we know how roughly the optics work how roughly the, the optics will uh, uh, work in the optical microscope and I have to say that this is very similar for the electron microscope except that electron microscope don't have optic lens
An electron microscope is working with electromagnetic lens. The reason for that we already discussed. This is because the electrons may be affected by the electric and magnetic field. So actually what's, uh, what we are doing is that we take a coil. Here we have a coil and make it more interesting. It started somewhere here, let's say. And uh, we put some current in the coil, so the current will go around, 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 and passing through and going out. And what's happening when you have a coil and the current is passing through the coil is that you, the magnetic field is generated around this coil. Uh, let's show the magnetic field with, say, the green. Here we have a magnetic field. The magnetic field is is around on this coil. I think you can you can imagine this that you have the coil and then you have uh, circles that are going around the the coil, whereas the center of the circle is the, is located in the center of uh, of the coils. So we have a magnetic field. Now we will pass an electron through it. Again, electrons uh, has to be blue because everybody knows that the electron is blue, yeah? Actually, electron has uh, no color, you know, everybody, I guess. Uh, so uh, an electron is coming into this lens. This lens, or I call it lens because I know that this is actual lens, uh, has an optical axis. And this optical axis actually works very similar to the optical axis of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, light lens or, or glass lens, that all the electrons that goes through the optical axis remains unaffected and they just simply pass through. What will happen when the electron gets closer to the magnetic field is that it will interact with the magnetic field and the magnetic field, the interaction of the particle with the magnetic field can be explained by the Lorentz force, whereas the Lorentz force explains you the force that uh, is applied to the particle with a certain charge that has a certain velocity in a magnetic and electric field. You know that every electric field is generating a magnetic field and vice versa, in the case when we have a coil. So here we have two fields and these two fields are actually affecting our charge or our charged particle. In this diagram the only non-vector, the only there's only one scalar, the only one scalar is the charge. The charge doesn't have any direction. Whereas everything else, the velocity of the electron actually has a direction. It's going from up to down here. The uh, magnetic field actually has a direction. It can go this way or it can go the other way. The electric field as well. Uh, the electricity can go go in here and go, come out there, or the opposite direction come out uh, go in here and come out there. Actually, what you have to know that the electric field and the magnetic field are bound. So. If the electric field is uh, uh, going this uh, this way, the magnetic field will be, of course, of one of these two possibilities, not both of them, because it's uh, uh, you can apply your your right hand uh, when the, your thumb will show uh, the uh, direction of the current, then uh, your fist uh, or uh, the fingers of your fist should show how. Uh, the magnetic field actually should rotate. So in this case, this is going here, we apply our thumb, so I guess the magnetic field should go like this. And we do a cross product of the magnetic field with the velocity vector, and this cross product will be a vector that's actually perpendicular to this magnetic field and to the velocity vector. So actually it will push our electron towards the uh, center of the optical axis. And actually then the electron will interact with the other uh, 
a magnetic field and it will always be pushed and pushed and pushed until it reaches the middle of the lens and from the middle of the lens it will be a kind of pushed out 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 because uh, you pass the half of it and, and the uh, direction is opposite and you get out from the lens I found maybe this this image what can show you how roughly the electron behaves in the electromagnetic lens that it's getting from a spot and it's turning around and getting to the focal point this this will be this is the property of the electromagnetic lens that it also focuses focus the the electrons at a certain point but the other property here is that because it's uh, rotating inside the magnetic field the image is also rotated so uh, what we have seen previously or on the previous slides that when we had a source we, we had for example here our arrow here was the arrow and we have the image of the arrow here we seen that that was actually inverted that the image uh, the magnified image was inverted in case of electro uh, uh, magnetic lens and the electron itself it is not only uh, inverted but it's cert uh, rotated by the sort certain angle so all the electromagnetic lens are also rotating your image this will be explained later where you can see it uh, if you take a look uh, on the middle image here you can see how roughly an electromagnetic lens uh, look like as we told there there are copper coils this this is just a cross section so think about the coil that was uh, dissected in half and you are taking a look on the cross section and you see all the wires that are going through the coil and this is embedded in a in a iron piece it's called the pole piece and this is uh, further homogenizing the uh, the magnetic field and it's also the magnetic field is regulated by this opening so it's it's forming this kind of magnetic field here and this kind of magnetic field there sorry magnetic field should be green so let's switch to green so here's the magnetic field coming out from it and that's something that's focusing our <clears throat> our electron beam from from the electron source uh, to the image plane well and the right bottom corner you can see that uh, how actually this electromagnetic class look like it's a huge coil of copper wire and you are applying uh, some current into this copper wire and that's how you are making the magnetic field so what there are some properties of the elect uh, electromagnetic lens that's good to know and one of the properties that depending on the uh, current that you apply to this uh, coil you can change the uh, intensity of the magnetic field so you are changing the intensity of the electric field therefore you are changing the intensity of the magnetic field as well this means that you can change the strength of your magnetic uh, of your electromagnetic lens this is very useful so virtually if you want to change a magnification and you want to change the strength of your lens you don't have to disassemble your microscope and change the lens or to have something like a revolver in a, in case of uh, uh, the optical microscope where you are exchanging the objective lens just because you want to have a different magnification here what you do is only you change the current in the coil and therefore you change the magnetic field and that changes the strength of the, uh, of the of the lens however this has one drawback and that's called hysteresis hysteresis is about the dependence of the magnetic field on the input current so we start with some input current and we have a certain mag oh, we have a certain magnetic field And while the input current will rise, the magnetic field will rise as well. Up somewhere here, where it's not rising anymore. It's a very nice sigmoidal curve. This is so far no problematic. We can measure this, <coughs> the, the magnetic field dependence on the uh, current applied to the coil. So in every point, we really know what 
is the strength of the magnetic field if we really know what was the input current. The problem comes when we go back. So we have applied this amount of current, we have this uh, mag uh, magnetic field, strength of magnetic field, and now we are starting to decrease the current. And what you would expect that you will, we will get back with the same curve that, uh, that we started with. The reality, however, is something like at a certain point it's the same, and then it diverges, and then it comes back. So what you can see here, this is a typical hysteresis curve. So the hysteresis curve tells you about that the value that you will get depends not only on the application of the uh, input current, but also uh, on, on the value that you were before and also on the direction from which you, uh, you come. Just take a look. So when we will go from here to here, uh, we apply this change in the current, we will increase the strength of the magnetic field. However, on this curve, we, oops, we see that we changed much less. You see the difference here and here. It's one difference and the second difference is this small. So, <coughs> sorry. so in this case, uh, it really depends whether you get to some state of uh, the magnetic lens uh, to the direction of rising or the direction of decreasing uh, the, uh, the input current. This is because uh, at a certain point when you get right up here with the magnetization, the lens itself starts to be magnetized. And if you just start to decrease the current, this magnetization is not instantly disappearing, but it's holding uh, the magnetic field and uh, just after a certain drop of the voltage or sorry, current, it will go back to the same value. If you want to avoid this effect and you really want to be certain that if I apply um, this current, I want to get this result and not this one, then simply what you do is that you play with your lenses that you go all the way up, all the way down, and then up back here. Because you know that if you went all the way up, all the way down, you are at this point, and from this point when you go again up, you will follow this curve, and you can get to this point. This is called lens normalization. Uh, another problem of, the non uh, of uh, this electromagnetic lens is that it's very hard to get an uh, extremely homogeneous lens. The property, uh, the, the magnetic field inside the lens uh, has some fluctuation and variation. The, you can try to make the best to make the coil as homogeneous as, as possible, still you will have some inhomogeneities inside the, uh, inside the lens and the cl usually the closer you are to the side of the lens of, the, of, this, uh, of this coil, the larger the aberrations are. What these aberrations are? <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, one of the aberration is astigmatism. This is the main aberration that we play uh, on the most of it. What uh, astigmatism is, that the focus in one direction is different than the defocus in other direction. Now, if you uh, take a look back on our uh, previous uh, uh, image with the, uh, uh, with the lens that brings the point into the focal point, what might happen that we only showed one plane where this happened. You can, for example, think about it that you take the perpendicular plane to that uh, plane that we visualized in, on our PowerPoint presentation. So you have a plane that it's uh, in plane, in parallel in plane with your screen, and then you take the same, that's a virtual perpendicular plane to the plane of your screen. And you take a look what will happen if the rays pass through your uh, object, uh, through your lens, and you will find out that actually in this direction, your lens are not bringing uh, the 
object into the focal point, but it's maybe slightly under-focused or slightly over-focused, but definitely is off-focus. And uh, this is the property of astigmatism. Astigmatism has a property that uh, the defocus in one direction is different than in uh, another direction, not necessarily perpendicular. And this is uh, relatively easily compensable by a stigmator. A stigmator, you can see a st uh, typical stigmator scheme here, is uh, just a set of electromagnets that are creating a, another magnetic field that compensates the non-homogeneity of the original lens. Usually uh, what you need is a quadruple. So you need to, uh, to have just uh, uh, two perpendicular axes. You, you just, uh, you right here, you have an x, y, uh, x axis and y axis, and this way you can deform the beam the way that there will be no astigmatism. In reality, uh, this quadruple is made by an octopole stigmator, what you can see here. Here you can count that there are actually eight poles, but these poles are connected. So if you take on the wiring, these poles are connected and they are still acting as a quadrupole. Just, uh, they find out that when they are using an octopole driven as a quadrupole, it is more homogeneous than to have a quadrupole driven as a quadrupole. When we get even to a higher aberrations, uh, then uh, you can see uh, like all the aberrations, the higher aberrations will affect you the most for the highest resolution. If you take a look here, you can see uh, this is an image that is uh, used to compensate for the chromatic, uh, for, for the spherical aberration uh, using the CS corrector. And the usable area of the lens is in the middle. In the middle you can see there's, there's a very even color. This color means the phase change of the electrons when they are passing through the lens. So virtually all the electrons that are passing in the circle have, have no phase change or they have the same phase change. Whereas the electrons that are getting closer to the side, these electrons are uh, changing their phases. And when they are changing the phases, you can think about it uh, like uh, in the case of X-ray crystallography, that not all your electrons that are hitting your sample are in phase, which is not good for you. Uh, this can be corrected by, uh, again, some uh, uh, octopole or more, more uh, hexapole, and here you can see double of coils, so there are 12 coils, it's again a, a doubled hex hexapole, and this is called a CS corrector. CS corrector is uh, not really used in cryopter microscopy because so far we are at a resolution where we are not <clears throat> extremely affected by the spherical aberration. Whereas in HRTM, the, for the material sciences, a CS corrector is essential to have. There are few Christ microscopes in the world with CS corrector, but uh, that's not necessarily something that you would uh, need to have if you are buying a new Christ. Uh, so, we are proceeding more. The mathematic description of aberrations. It is good to know that all these aberrations that we talked about, this uh, uh, defocus uh, or uh, ab uh, astigmatism, can be described by a mathematical apparatus. There was a man called Fritz Zernike who actually made the polynomials, and these polynomials are describing how the beam will be aberrated with some astigmatism. This is the third polynomial and the fifth polynomial. And, for example, by the spherical aberration, there's a twelfth polynomial. Uh, of course, these are just some sample aberrations. This, uh, the, this is just the shape of the plane, but actually how exactly the plane will look like will depend on the coefficients of these uh, Zernike polynomials. And nowadays, uh, what they try to do is they try to f figure out from the major data uh, how well it fits to some of these planes, or certainly to astigmatism and spherical aberration, and they try to find the Zernike coefficients to correct for them mathematically. This is just to let you know the, uh, what's the state of the art of the image processing, which will be later uh, lectured by uh, Jezino Novacek. Well, so uh, already we went through uh, the gun, gun deflection, and now we know how the electromagnetic lens work. Let's use them. We will 
take a look on the illumination system. So you see, we went from the very top of the microscope, we are gradually getting lower and lower, and we will end up somewhere here by the end of the presentation. But now we are here in this part, this part is over the sample stage and it's called the illumination system or the condenser system. The condenser system consists of two, at least two, lenses, C1 lens and C2 lens. As well, there's a stigmator, we already told about what stigmator, so this C2 stigmator is stigmating the C2 lens. And uh, there are a few apertures, we will talk about apertures a little bit later. So, uh, the illumination system of the major type of the electron microscopes are two condenser based, so C1 uh, to condenser lens based, C1 and C2 condenser. Whereas there are few microscopes, as Titan Cryos, that has a three condenser system, it's a little bit more complicated, but gives uh, sometimes a better results. We will show you why it's so. The condenser, we told that has some aperture, and here I have to say that uh, your data is that good, that good your illumination beam was. The illumination beam is really the essential part of the imaging. So many of the people think that the most uh, the the, high, uh, the most important thing is, for example, to tune the estimates of the objective aperture because that's forming the image and that's extremely important. That's not true. That's not solely true. That's very important. But another thing that's very important is the illumination. With a bad illumination, you won't get a, a good data. So at first, you have to play with your microscope to achieve the perfect illumination and then you can follow down. Uh, this is usually as well the alignment of the microscope. When you are aligning the microscope, then first you try to align your gun if it's needed, then you align the illumination system, then you align the <coughs> objective system and following up by the projector system. So you are going from up to down. Okay, uh, our goal for illumination is to achieve a coherent and parallel illumination. Let's see how we can achieve it. As I told you, we have two uh, lens. We have a C1, C1 lens and a C2 lens. Uh, you remember how I told you that we are now visualizing a single point from very top. We can imagine that this, at this very top, this is the source of the electrons, this is the gun. And now from the gun, uh, the rays are coming, the beam is coming, and the C1 lens converge this uh, beam to some focal point. Now depending on the strength of this uh, C1 lens, you get the focal point closer or uh, closer or farther from the C1 lens itself. What will happen if we take another lens, the C2 lens, that we can arrange the lens the way that it will take these rays and bend them the way that they will be parallel and they will form a spot here. And what you can see here that uh, if we tuned our lens, the C2 lens, the way that it's always producing a parallel spot, then here we have a small spot and here we have a large spot. But uh, it depends on the settings of the C1 lens. And because all the electrons are passing through both of the lens, in this small spot we have a kind of higher concentration of electrons per area than in the case of the large spot. So what we are doing when you are, we are changing the strength of the C1, uh, uh, C1 lens is that we are changing the flux of the electrons that are hitting our sample. So uh, when we are changing the so-called spot size on the C1 lens, then we are changing actually the dose that we will apply to our sample. Now take a look on a C2 lens. In the previous example, we just uh, take in consideration that we always align the C2 lens that it will produce a parallel beam. But actually, what we can do with the C2 lens, now we have a C1 lens up here, and the C1 lens here is always set to the same spot size. So here the strength of the lens is not changing, the focal point of the lens is not changing. What is changing is changing the strength of the C2 lens. And what we can do with the same beam coming from the C1 lens, we can converge this beam to make it smaller and non-parallel. We can make a parallel beam and we can make a spreading beam. 
For the high resolution uh, imaging, the parallel beam is essential. So you will find out that a certain set of a C1 lens, you will need to uh, set a certain uh, strength of the C2 lens to actually produce a parallel beam. Now again, you, you can see that the flux here, here are, because all the electrons are passing from the gun through the C1 lens and all of them are passing the C2 lens and all of them are concentrating on, uh, on the sample area. Here they are concentrating a smaller uh, area, whereas here on the larger area, you can see that here there will be a higher flux, whereas here there will be a lower flux. And uh, at a certain setting when we have a parallel beam, we have a certain flux of the electrons that we simply cannot change this way. But what we can do, what we can do is uh, to use an aperture. What the aperture is? The aperture is a, is a metal strip that has drilled some holes in it. Actually, these holes are very small. The holes are of sizes of uh, 30 to 150 micrometers. Usually we are using C2 apertures uh, 50, 70, 100 micrometers and these apertures are helping us uh, to control the size of the beam that is actually on the, on the sample area. So take a look on this. So we now have from the previous example a set of C1 lens that is not changing any, uh, always here and we have a set of C2 lens that strength is not changing as well whereas the C2 lens is producing here a parallel beam. Now, because uh, a beam is causing a certain damage to our uh, sample, we want to acquire more images at this area. Therefore, we need to limit the size of the beam because we want, uh, want to move to others, uh, other place and we don't want to cross over the two beams. So we are, we are taking, we have a beam we are taking one point here, and then uh, we want to take this, uh, take an image of this point as well, but you will see that actually this point will be double exposed. Therefore, you want to make a smaller circle of your illumination beam so that when you are illuminating both of these points, these, uh, these illumination areas are actually not uh, double exposing or crossing themselves. So how to achieve this is uh, that we can apply an aperture. You can see that uh, when we apply an aperture, we are just sh just shading out the part of the beam that's shaded out by the metal strip, and only the part is going through uh, the hole inside uh, the aperture, and that will limit the image of the beam or the size of the beam on the sample area. If you use a smaller aperture, then we will have a smaller beam. This will actually not limit the flux because. Uh, you just kind of crop out this area from here so the amount of electrons that are coming here is actually the same on this area only you shaded the, the extra space that would be illuminated so what we learned here is about the illumination system is that the C1 lens what we uh, have here its strength can be changed in steps so when you uh, the microscope uh, and you want to change the strength of the C1, you are using it, you are changing it by the spot size. The spot size has discrete values. It goes from 1 to 11 uh, in case of uh, um, Titan Cryos microscope, and you simply cannot change to a three and a half, for example. You can have just discrete values of the strength of the C1 lens. And it has a very big impact on the uh, electron flux. The C2 lens, uh, strength can change uh, gradually, so you really have a knob that you can turn right and left and you can uh, change the size, the, the condense, condensing beam to spreading beam or to parallel beam and this knob is called intensity or brightness on geo microscopes. This controls really the convergence of the beam and uh, this way you can also uh, control the flux of the electrons to the sample which will affect the total dose. However, here you have to be also uh, careful about setting the proper settings for the parallel beam. When you are doing a uh, screening experiment, uh, you really don't care about parallelity of the beam. But when you are data collecting for high resolution data, then you have to be aware of proper settings of the C1 and C2 combination to have a parallel beam. 
the aperture as we told about uh, the aperture just cuts out the part of the beam after the C2 and it reduces the illuminated area but inside this illuminated area the dose the flux of the electrons will be the same here you can see just uh, some pre representation how actually uh, aperture strip look like where you have some this is the holder part how it's installed into the microscope and here you have series of of holes where there's smallest and the largest hole uh, I don't really know what the sizes are in this case, but they are in the range of micrometers or tens of micrometers. Well, uh, so far we were talking about the two condenser system, which is the most uh, used one for the electron microscopes. In case of very high in the microscopes, as Titan Creos, uh, maybe the Geo Cryo arm has three condenser system as well. Uh, there is a condenser lens three, a C3 lens. And this seat reliance, actually what it does is uh, that it allows us to uh, make pearl the beam that was not pearl when he was coming out from the C2. So actually uh, in this case we have a setup where the C2 is making a convergent beam. So if we won't have a C3 here, we would have a very small illuminated area, but the beam would not be parallel. What the C3 runs, that actually it's uh, uh, it's changing uh, the path of the beam the way that it will be parallel. So you can have a different illuminated area with a parallel beam than you would have only with a C2. Because if C2 would, uh, you want to have a parallel area with a C2, then your beams would look like this with the proper settings, and your illuminated area would be this big. Interestingly, with exactly the same setting of uh, of C1, we are not changing the C1, we change the C2 to make now a diverging beam, and again we change the C3 the way that it makes a parallel beam out from it. So now with the same settings we made a larger beam. And this C3 gives us a large variability from what range we can have a, a beam in a parallel setup. So while in the C2 you are limited to a certain value, in case of C3 you can vary it uh, in a range of values. The range of values is actually what you see if you want to uh, increase the beam uh, diameter here, you are actually not only affecting the strength of the C3 lens, which is here bigger and smaller, but also affecting the strength of the C2 lens to make, for example, in this case, from converging to a diverging beam. So actually, uh, to make this work, you have, again, a ratio in between the C2 and C3 lens setup, which gives you a parallel beam. Actually, this is calibrated in the microscope, and when you are tuning your intensity knob, you are, uh, you are making your beam larger and smaller and still parallel, and what it does in the background, it, it's combining the strength of the proper C2 and C3 setup to give you a parallel beam. Now, now that we ended with the illumination system, we will move to the objective lens system. The objective lens system is located in the near middle of the microscope, and this part is the microscope where the sample, which is represented by this rod, is inserted the microscope in. The objective lens has the highest strength, the highest magnification among all the, all, all the lens uh, in the microscope. Therefore, it has as well the largest aberrations. So here we really need to take care about the stigmators uh, to have an astigmatic beam. What we have an extra here, you see here we have the stigmator, here are the objective lens. There are two lens actually, one is the upper lens and one is the uh, lower lens, and they, they act together. Uh, is an objective aperture. Uh, the objective aperture here is not anymore limiting you in the way of illumination because we are behind our, uh, our sample. So the illumination is from the top up to sample and from the sample down there is no uh, illumination anymore. So here your uh, objective aperture has a very different function. The, the function of the objective aperture is that uh, in case of uh, interaction of electrons with, uh, with your sample, the electrons are scattering. And 
uh, what happens uh, is that the electrons that are scattering the most are usually in a, inelastically scattered. So if the electron is scattered at this very high angle, then these are likely electrons that are inelastically scattered, are not good electrons for us, we will later tell why, and mainly they are contributing to noise, whereas the elastically scattered electrons have a uh, lower diff uh, diffraction angle and they are very constructive for us. What you do is that you insert an aperture that will limit uh, the beam or the scattered electron beam that has a certain angle. Now, uh, here is a little bit drawback. So it would be very nice to distinguish in between the electrons that are the good guys and the bad guys only by a simple aperture. That's not doable. Maybe you remember from X-ray crystallography already that uh, the high resolution uh, information is scattering at a, at a higher angle than the low resolution information. So when you had the diffractogram out from uh, an X-ray experiment, uh, the closer it was, to, the closer the spots were to the center, the more they uh, were of the low resolution information containing the low resolution information were areas uh, the beam that was scattered to uh, to the sides or, or further from the center, uh, the angle of scattering was higher and it was also carrying a high resolution data. Now, you cannot distinguish if you have a high angle of scattering because of inelastic uh, interaction of electron or because if this electron is simply carrying some high resolution data. Therefore, you, you, when you insert an objective aperture, you have to be really uh, aware of what is the cutoff of the aperture. So, for example, uh, a, a hundred micrometer aperture on the cryos has a cutoff of, I, I think, two angstrom resolution. So, if you're aiming to a better resolution than two angstrom, then you certainly shouldn't use this uh, aperture. But if your resolu aim of resolution is worse, then you could use this aperture because one of the uh, one of the outcomes of using this aperture is that when you filter out this uh, electron scattered at high angle, you are actually improving the contrast. You are virtually decreasing the noise of your uh, of your data because the noisy electrons are filtered out, and therefore your contrast improves. One more thing that you have to think about when you're using an aperture, that the aperture actually has an influence on the astigmatism of the objective lens. This is very important to know because uh, people are s tuning the astigmatism of the objective lens then they are inserting the aperture and they forget about to tune the, uh, the astigmatism correction or stigmator for this new setup and this is very important to do so. Now, uh, let's move to the other part of this uh, objective lens system setup. And this part is on this image here is the sample part. So I redraw this part uh, of the microscope a little bit differently. This, uh, this is uh, more realistic. Okay, I'm, I'm not really a painter, so a schematically realistic, I would say. Uh, whereas our magnets of the objective lens are represented a little bit differently. Uh, this uh, lens actually has this strange shape where you have, here is the coil and there is some extra metal piece, it's called the pole piece. And this pole piece is actually uh, giving you better homogeneity of, uh, uh, of the magnetic field. Now. Uh, in case of a twin objective lens like here, we have an upper lens and a, and a lower lens, the best for us would be to have this pole piece as close as possible to our uh, sample, which is not really possible in case of a cryo-EM setup. The problem with cryo setup in comparison with, for example, some material microscopy is that uh, you really want to move your sample and you, or you want to, sometimes to tilt your sample. So. Uh, the stage, the sample stage, which is this rod inserted in the microscope and controlled by some, some uh, motors, can move in uh, x direction, can move in y direction, as well it can move in z direction. 
And the Z direction is important for us as well because uh, you are setting the focus in, the, in precision with uh, with microns or or uh, tens of microns, and you never can be sure how uh, flat your sample is. So sometimes you need to bring it higher, sometimes bring it lower to have it in a focal position. As well as uh, the microscope uh, is rotating this rod uh, the way uh, that if you take a look from uh, from the side on your on your disc, so if this is your sample disc and you rotate it and take a look from this side, then when you rotate this disc, you want to rotate it by the axis of your sample. Yeah, so you want to have this rotation. What might happen if you have an off-axis rotation, so you have your sample here and you are rotating it by this axis, that actually you will rotate your sample like this. Yeah, exaggerated. So that means that this point, what, what was for example the point of our interest, we have a point of interest here somewhere, that's actually while rotating moving to this position or this position, whereas here where we have this point in the center, it was always stayed in the center. So when you want to have your um, position uh, always in the center while tilting and rotating, then uh, you have to set your so-called eocentric height. This is the only position where when you rotate your sample, you will rotate it uh, according to the center of the sample axis. Now, uh, this is limiting a little bit our, our pole pieces, how close they can be, and this is a it's not a bug, a feature or, or the construction property of a cryopter microscope that uh, for a material microscope these pole pieces are closer, we cannot get, have them closer because of this rotation, as well as there is one more thing, and I think is a so-called uh, decontamination box. Uh, while there is a very high vacuum in the electron microscope, there is always some water vapor present and other contaminants. And what might happen if uh, these uh, particles are flying around and our sample is cooled at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, so it's really freezing, uh, it's really frozen, uh, then if this particle will attach to your sample, they will, it will freeze there and will stay there. So gradually, uh, what we would see in the microscope, that there will be a build up of uh, contamination on our sample. This uh, is uh, sold by introduction of a small box, which has a small hole on the top and the bottom. Otherwise, it's closed. And of course, there, there, there's another hole where, where enters the, uh, the sample. Then uh, we put this to a liquid nitrogen temperature. So we will have the same temperature here in the box and this, as, this is the temperature of the, uh, of the sample. So when these particles will be flying around, there is more and more likely that they will attach to this decontamination box that they will attach to our sample. Uh, a sample stage that's moving X, Y, Z and uh, rotating, uh, tilting uh, the sample is a very crucial part of the electron microscope and the cruciality of this part is, was explained also when I was visiting a company that was producing electron microscopes and they were telling me that many of the components they are outsourcing and they are getting the components and they're assembling the microscope out from it except for the stage. This has to be really well done, therefore we are doing it on ourselves. So really a, a stable uh, stage is crucial for high resolution microscopy because you don't want to have drifts, you don't want to have imperfect, imprecise movements in the microscope. Now, uh, let's follow, the follow up or follow down. So let's move down one more, once more. We are getting from this uh, objective system to the projector system. Where in the projector system we start with two deflectors, uh, selected area aperture and set of uh, three lens, and the diffraction and the, and the stigmator. It's called diffraction stigmator. For now, I would say that we won't bother with the diffraction stigmator and the selected area aperture. These two things are uh, mainly useful when you are use, uh, doing diffraction 
with electron microscope, which is also possible. So on the electron microscope, you are not limited by the imaging feature. You can do diffraction experiments as well. Nowadays, they try to uh, improve it for the biological samples, and they try to uh, make the so-called micro-ED. It's a combination of cryo-electron microscopy with diffraction. So they are not using the microscope for imaging, but using the microscope for diffraction. And then this is very useful to, to, to them to select an area they want to see the diffraction from with this aperture. For us, this is uh, so far not that important. Uh, the projector system itself uh, takes care of uh, the final projection of your data, of your sample, on the detector. So when well, I told you that the objective uh, has an uh, objective lens has a magnification of around 50 times, that's not a big deal. You would say so 50 times is optical microscope do as well. But here we gradually can set our uh, projector lens or the intermediate lens, sometimes they are called, uh, in the range of 10 to, to 20 times. So if we add up uh, 10 times 10 times 10 is 1000 times 50, it's 50,000 already. Yeah? And if you set one of these to 20, you will get to 100,000. So you gradually magnify your image. Now, uh, the problem here during the magnification process is that uh, we already told about that the electron, when, uh, when it's uh, getting through the lens, is rotated. Therefore, the image is rotated as well. Now, for modern microscopes, uh, they try to uh, set up the ratio in between these lens that they won't introduce a major rotation in the image. However, there are some special magnification modes for the microscope in which uh, actually the microscope switches off one of these three lens. There is a low mag. This is a low mag magnification. It's maybe from 40 times to 1200 times. This is a special option where only low magnification ranges uh, is available for the microscope. But in this case, one of these three lens is switched off. Then you get to the high magnification range, which is uh, called SA or the selected aperture range. And here you go from maybe 2,500 to 150,000. And in this case, all these three are engaged. And then when you are doing uh, energy filtered uh, microscopy, we will get to that later, uh, then again, you need to switch off one of these lens. And this switching on and off, that means that uh, you will get a different number of lens that are affecting your beam is causing actually the image rotation. So what uh, certainly happens is that when you are getting from a low mag mode to a selected aperture uh, uh, mode, then your uh, image rotates. Sometimes it rotates by 90 degrees, sometimes even more. But some people are shocked that, okay, I just switched the magnification from 1500 to 2000 and actually what happened to my image where I am. This is because for that magnification, actually the microscope is setting up a combination where uh, either one of these lenses is disabled or all of them are enabled. Uh, now, we have a set of image deflectors up here. They are very interesting image deflectors. Uh, or they are called image deflectors, but actually they are electron deflectors as, as previously we, we learned about. So, uh, let's see what, how we can uh, move on our sample. <clears throat> State shift versus image shift or beam shift. Let's take uh, an example that we have a sample grid, uh, a grid with our sample in the microscope and we are imaging the particle red one, particle A. Now we want to image the particle B, which is green. We have the path of our uh, electron, it's starting from the gun, going all these condenser lenses, objective lenses, projector lenses to the detector. It's, it's pretty straight, should be, because it's going through the optical axis of the microscope. And now we want to uh, make an image of the green ball. So we move the stage, we move the sample. All the sample we move to make it coincident with the beam. This is called stage shift. Where there is another way how we can do that. What if? We use our beam deflectors, 
not the not the gun deflectors, but the beam deflectors that are right before the objective lens, and we deflect the beam the way that it will hit the green ball. The good thing is that we managed to get the illumination to the green one, but unfortunately we are missing our detector because uh, the detector is not in the same axis. Yeah. So here is the microscope axis, optical axis. Now we are getting off axis and getting back uh, and, and not getting back. But what we can do, we can include our new deflectors, image deflectors that are part of the projection system, and we can deflect this beam back. So it will reach the, uh, the detector again. Now we, we are imaging our green ball without any movement of the stage. If you take a look, the sample remained at the same place where it was before. Yeah. So your, your stage is still at the same position. You haven't moved the stage, you haven't manipulated mechanically with your sample, you just move the beam and move it back. This is called uh, image shift and uh, beam shift image shift uh, assisted uh, in collection. It has some advantages uh, uh, over the stage shift because stage shift is a mechanical thing. So you are driving the motors to move the stage and it has a certain amount of, uh, uh, of play. So it's not 100% accurate and it cannot be because we are at the range of uh, sometimes moving by uh, by few micrometers all, all, the, um, all the sample. When we move our sample with a stage shift, we have to wait to stabilize the stage because stage is slightly drifting so we don't want to collect with this drift it takes time for Christ it's pretty fast it's 15 seconds but for other microscopes you are waiting for minutes uh, large movements we can do with stage shift the stage shift actually can walk all around the grid so you can move your grid left to, or to right you can uh, screen a very large area by, by stage movement that's the very advantage of the stage shift but uh, as I told, small precision. Now, when we go to beam shift, the beam shift is done by electromagnetic uh, deflectors, and it has a faster stabilization. So we can count with a three to five second stabilization, which is three to five times faster than the stage shift. So after five seconds, uh, the, these deflectors will stabilize the way that the image will not move, will not drift. Uh, Actually, there's the disadvantage of this uh, beam shift collection is that uh, there are only small movements that you can do. So usually it's limited to, to a range of a uh, few micrometers. This is still uh, useful because uh, sometimes you are, uh, or many times, uh, you are collecting data that in a one uh, hole of, uh, of the sample, which has a diameter of two micrometers, you are collecting, for example, five acquisition areas. And this you can do with beam shift. Uh, beam shift has higher precision than the stage shift because it's not moving that much and there is no mechanics there. But what we already told about that if you don't have set very properly the pivot points of these uh, deflectors, there might be some beam tilt induced in the beam shift. And this is always present. This is something that you cannot really get rid of, but you try to minimize it the most you can. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are some uh, new uh, uh, new regimes of the microscopes that r extremely increases this 5 micrometer range of the beam shift. So we are getting to tens of microns and we are really speeding up our uh, acquisition speed. Re sometimes really doubling the, the speed of acquisition because of the movements you, you need to do when you are acquiring data. Now. This is just a just a summarization of the optic system of the electron microscope. So, uh, of, of the electron microscope, electron microscope is built of many optic components, but out of them we have the electromagnetic lens, deflectors, stigmators, and apertures. Out from this, only the apertures are mechanical part. All the other parts are electromagnetic uh, parts that are somehow influencing the beam. You can see that almost every system, if I take the condenser system or uh, the objective system, have their own sets of lens, stigmators, deflectors. Yeah. So 
you can uh, we can argue if this belongs here or to the objective part or this here to the, or the gun part it, def it depends uh, person to person how they classify whether the deflector belongs here or there but in fact all this system has their own set of uh, electromagnetic lens own set of uh, stigmators for those lens and their apertures and their deflectors now uh, there is one more thing that's uh, uh, usual, not usual for all the microscopes, but very useful, and uh, it's a kind of optics of the microscope as well. It's called, oh, sorry, uh, it's called energy filter. Energy filter uh, is is a very important part uh, for some experiments, whereas it's not crucial for all the experiments. Uh, what it is about? So uh, when we have uh, an interaction of the electron with the atom we can describe it as follows. There's an electron that passes nearby the atom, but it's not affected at all with, uh, with the electron or the, or, or the nucleus of the, uh, the electrons uh, uh, in the atom or the nucleus of the atom and passes through, so it's, it remains undifracted. Then there are electrons that are actually bent by the, by the atom, so they are diffracted and they are scattered in an elastic uh, way. So that means that they are scattered, but they are not losing any energy. So it's a perfect uh, elastic kind of bouncing of electron from the atom that uh, it comes here, it bounces, it uh, uh, scatters and reaches here, which you can see a difference in the position, but it has losing no energy for this. And then there's a third type where areas, it happens that the electron accidentally hit another electron in the atom and it passes past of the, uh, passes uh, part of the energy because this this has a very high energy this electron this is accelerated by 300,000 volts so passes part of the energy to this electron and continues in in his journey now I, here i've shown that it actually has a lower energy this electron so that has to change some of the properties now uh, what might happen to this original electron is that the energy that was passed from one electron to the other one might be uh, emitted as a radiation, and usually it's emitted as an X radiation or gamma radiation, as well as uh, uh, it might happen that this electron will be completely kicked out from uh, from this uh, from the atom, and it will uh, be uh, some kind of uh, secondary scattered electron. Nevertheless, this electron will lose a part of his energy. Uh, and because it loses part of its energy, its wavelength and its frequency will change. So uh, for us, it would be very beneficial to be able to filter out these electrons that have lost their energy. Why we want to do that? Because uh, all the image formation and all these analysis of the image formation relies on the thing that all the electrons were scattered elastically. In the case of elastically scattered electron, you can really predict how it was scattered and what happened to the electron. In case of inelastic scattering, you never know what part of the energy was actually passed to the other electron, what happened to that, as well as you don't know the trajectory. This electron might, may pass through straight away, but what might happen is that it can also scatter at a certain angle yeah, and, and reach up here. And this angle can, can be pretty high, so what, what might happen is that we can uh, nicely filter out this electron with an objective uh, aperture, but that's not always the case. It would be nice to have a device that can filter the bad electrons out from the good electrons merely on the energy that they carry. And this is called energy filter. How we are doing it? Now we are again inspired by the optics from the, uh, from the light. What we are doing is we, we take a prism. If you take a look on the white light, the white light is polychromatic. White light contains a light of wavelength of uh, from very large, from the red one, to the very small uh, wavelength of the purple or violet one. This is all in the white light. If we think about our electron, our electron is quite monochromatic. So that would be like we are only using one part of it, but when the electron actually changes its frequency, changes its wavelength, that 
imply something similar that if the light would change its color from one color to the other one because it changed the wavelength. So virtually what we want to do, we want to have a filter that will filter out only the wavelength that we are interested in, the unscattered electrons wavelength. This is easy. We just put a slit and we let pass only the wavelength that we are interested in. Actually, if, if you take a look on this uh, prism, this is what you have in your spectrophotometer. When you are tuning the spectrophotometer, that uh, what uh, frequency you want to uh, measure your absorption, absorbance, then you simply just tuning uh, where the slits should be positioned in this uh, uh, in this area, whether to pass the yellow light or the red light or the uh, or the blue light. Actually, here uh, in the spectrophotometer, you are not moving uh, the slit. But you are moving the prism, so you're moving the, the beam. But we want to do that with the electrons. Electrons, again, don't need or don't want to have any glass components, so we are doing it with an electromagnetic prism. And the electromagnetic prism looks like an L-shaped tube where the electron passes through. And when the electron is uh, virtually making a, a change in, in the direction of 90 degrees, then uh, the electrons that has a different uh, frequency ha will have a different pathway inside this tube. So you are here virtually splitting the, uh, the trajectory of the electrons that have, uh, the, uh, let's say, mainstream wavelength with the electrons that were inelastically scattered and have a lower wavelength. Mm. Higher wavelength. Now, uh, this is called an omega filter. It's called omega filter because it looks like an omega. So you pass your electron all the way here and back, and then down here you put a slit. That's again a kind of aperture with an opening. And you filter out every bad electron and let pass only the, the good electrons. This is one way how you can do it with an omega filter. You can do it with a filter that has only one uh, one banding, one L-shaped uh, prism, that's a called a post cone filter. Again, your electron comes in, then it gets plated into the spectra of all the uh, energies that it has, and then you have a slit that only let pass the, uh, the energy of the electron of the interest. Now, while this looks a little bit uh, more straightforward construction than this one, actually, what happens is that uh, all these components that are bending the electron beam are adding up some aberrations. And what happens in the omega filter that when you take a look, you are, you are taking a way to here and then taking a way back. So you are actually making a, a forward and reverse procedure. And what aberrations we added to the blue beam, beam here then here we actually remove those aberrations. So we don't need to correct for the aberrations at this stage and we can just uh, steadily filter out the uh, electrons that are of un not our interest. Whereas here there are aberrations introduced into the uh, main beam as well and therefore we need a, a quadruple or sextuple lens to correct for these aberrations and you have to align this as well. By the end, there is some camera. Here can we have a camera as well. So, uh, why is one called in-column filter and the other one called a post-column filter? Uh, because one is in-column and one is post-column. So, here we have an electron microscope where we here is the gun, here is the condenser system, here you have uh, the stage and starting the projector system, and here you, you just include an energy filter, which is here shown by some prism. So the electron actually goes here, 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 back, and following his path. Uh, this omega type of filter is simply integrated into the column of the microscope. The L-shaped filter is actually the very last part, so it goes uh, beyond uh, the energy field, uh, the projection system, and uh, it's the very last part of the microscope <laughs> uh, that you have really underneath it. Uh, uh, and simply you need to have only one camera in inserted here because that energy filter is... Oh, sorry, this is not really true. Well, let me take this back. You can use multiple cameras. 
Now, <clears throat> electron detectors. As I told you, uh, we cannot use ordinary uh, eye or, or naked eye to detect electrons. We are, or eye is simply not sensitive for electron, and we need to somehow convert these electrons to some useful information. The most straightforward way, which is what is used for, what is used for decades, uh, is a fluorescent screen. The fluorescent screen, what you can see here on the image, is actually a screen that is uh, covered with zinc sulfide, and uh, when the electron beam uh, or an electron hits the zinc sulfide, it creates a uh, phosphorescent or fluorescence. And this fluorescence is of greenish tint, uh, so all the microscopists all look on the green images when they are looking on the uh, on the fluorescent screen. Uh, this has some advantage. It's a quite robust system. It's very hard to destroy it. Uh, it, you can really converge the beam on it, you, you can have high doses on it and, and it can withstand a, a large amount of abuse, whereas the other ones maybe are less, uh, less forgiving. Uh, the bad thing is that uh, you can only take a look on it, see what's there, but you virtually don't have any recording of it. Uh, for m very modern microscopes, you actually don't have any more this window where you can see by your eye uh, the fluorescent screen. Instead of that, there is a CCD camera that's looking on the screen and it's transmitting it to, to the computer that you are using for controlling the microscope. The most ancient method of recording uh, uh, is, uh, is film. Recording of electrons on film. Actually, electrons, when they pass the, ener the energy on the film, they uh, reduce the silver from uh, on the film and uh, it's a pretty linear response. The more dose of electrons, the the darker the film comes out. And uh, the problem here, uh, so the good thing is that uh, the resolution here is limited by the grain of the film. The finer grain of the film has, the finer the resolution what you get from it, it has. The problem is that if you want to make a software processing of this, you need to uh, digitize this film. So you need to scan it. This is an extra step. And uh, the last thing is that uh, you can simply expose the film once. So if during this exposure there's a drift, this drift is recorded on the film and you cannot compensate for that. The last two detectors, the CCD and the direct electron detectors, are electronic devices and I will just explain them uh, on the next slides. So the CCD camera is the uh, charged coupled device, the CCD. Uh, it converts electrons to light uh, to detect by the CCD. Now, uh, here's a, this, is, this was a kind of workaround. Before we had uh, direct electron detectors, we had no devices that can directly detect electrons. So we always needed to convert the electrons to photons and then to detect the photons. So what's happening here is that the electron is coming to a layer that's called scintillator. The scintillator is a chemical compound that when interacts with, uh, with an electron, the electron passes the energy to this compound and the compound is able to create a photon. The photon then goes from the scintillator through an optic fiber right to the pixel of the CCD detector. So uh, here you have the CCD detectors, there's array of pixels of uh, 4K by 4K for 16 megapixel camera, for example. And this is the way how you can register uh, your events of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the electrons that arrive to the scintillator. Now the problem is obvious. The problem is that we have an extra step in between the detection. So we need to convert the electrons to photons. The question sometimes is, is the, uh, the conversion quantitative? Well, it is, but not always. And another problem is that uh, what might happen here that when an electron comes here, it can scatter inside the scintillator and actually the electron that we would likely detect in this pixel will hit this pixel. Uh, so it will arrive at a different pixel than actually it arrived on the scintillator. This is really unwanted and, and gives you some background noise. Another thing is that scintillator is also capable of, uh, of recording cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are rays of uh, high energy and actually when they are hitting the scintillator, the scintillator glows and creates an extremely bright spot on the CCD.
this uh, previously when, when there were data processing from CCDs, they really needed to uh, get rid of these overexposed pixels. Another drawback of the CCD is the gradual readout of the CCD. The CCD cannot read out uh, each pixel, it has to read out by transferring. So actually, if I want to get the data from this pixel, I first need to get rid of data from this one, then this one transfer here, this one transfer here, this one transfer here, through here, and gradually transfer it to the readout device. This is the property of CCD. Whereas the CMOS devices, it has their own electronics, uh, which can directly send a signal out for, for the readout. The direct electron detector itself uh, already uh, states what it is. It's a detector that can uh, detect electrons directly. So when the electron is coming to the detector, it detects the electron without any conversion to photons. It, uh, it uh, uh, converts it to charge the, uh, the instant electron and then reads it out. It's much faster than the CCD cameras were, so nowadays the fastest camera that uh, is available is around 20, uh, 1500 or 1500 frames per second. Routinely we have a camera here that has a 400 frames per second that I can read out. Uh, to even further uh, increase the sensitivity of this camera and remove some of the artifacts, the new generation of these cameras are so-called back-thinned direct electron detectors. And what this back-thinning is, is uh, uh, shown here. So actually what they find out that when the electron uh, gets into the silicone, uh, silicone layer, uh, it gets scattered. And let's think about that this is our pixel. So here are our pixels. Pixels are of this size. roughly. And when we have a very thick layer of, uh, of silicon here, what we can uh, see that the electron that's getting here is starting to, uh, to scatter and some path, some path of this electron will go actually back and hit this pixel. So the incident electron was here but actually it's detected not only in this place, but it's detected here as well. So what we are doing is we are removing this extra layer, this large part, we make a very thin part, and what you can see that in this thin part, the scattering actually happens only in this volume, that means that it always remains in, in our pixel. So only one pixel will be affected by the incident electron. Uh, these cameras are very sensitive, they can be destroyed by a very high beam current so they are because of their sensitivity and they have two modes one is the integral mode one is the counting mode the integral mode uh, works the way that the more electron gets to the pixel the brighter the pixel will be so we are reading out for example once per second uh, the exposure and we see that okay here is a pixel with a high brightness then there is a high signal, a low brightness is a low signal. We don't have a direct uh, conversion to how many electrons were at the high signal and how many electrons at the low signal, but there's a ratio in between them. In counting mode, however, we are limiting the number of electrons uh, to such a low uh, rate that in the readout of the camera, which is 400 frames per second, so 1 over 400 is, uh, is the time needed for one readout, is actually uh, the possibility of hitting one pixel is the possibility that only one electron can hit it, no multiple electrons. So we know that actually if this pixel was white, then actually it was hit by an electron, but only one, because the, the flux was so low that no other electrons can arrive at the same time to the same pixel. So this is called the count counting mode and it gives superior results to, uh, to the linear integrity mode. This is just to show uh, the difference in between the direct electron detectors and the film or the CCD camera. <coughs> the detective quantum, uh, quantum efficiency just shows you that how well uh, the device can register the signal at certain frequencies. So the more to the right we are going, the higher frequencies, the higher resolution information we are registering. Well, you can see that actually the CCD camera was very bad in this. So the CCD camera was never very useful for high resolution imaging 
because it's it's really fast drops down by by the DQE. The, actually, the film was better. So the first three angstrom resolution uh, data that was out was not done by direct electron detector nor by CCD, but that was actually scanned from a film because the film has a, film has a better DQE than uh, than the CCD cameras. And then now uh, he, here we have uh, new detectors: the Falcon 2, the K2. Actually, this sounds new, but uh, nowadays they are old because there is Falcon 4 and K3. But you can see the huge difference in the DQE. So this is really what, what has driven the resolution revolution uh, for the cryoelectron microscopy. And this is how we converted cryoelectron microscopy from probology to actual uh, uh, method for structural biology. This is just to show you how these detectors look like. This is the K2 detector, K3 detector from Gatan. And from Thermo Scientific, we have the Falcon detectors. And uh, to see in the microscope where they are installed, here is the falcon detector. And this blue thing, what you can see here, this is the L-shaped uh, L-shaped energy filter. And at the very back of this energy filter is the K2 detector on our microscope. Now, the vacuum system. Uh, the transmission electron microscope uh, needs a really stable vacuum system and a, with a very high vacuum. This is because of the gun. We already showed that the fact is very sensitive for this. And for this, we are using uh, different pumps. We, uh, we are using a rotary pump, diffusion pump, molecular pump, IGP pump. Not all of them are used, but uh, all these uh, pumps are used in electron microscopy at some stage or, or, or for some instrument. The rotary pump, uh, is simply an oil pump that uh, makes an under pressure of a relatively low vacuum, but this pump is usually used as a first step for the pumping. Uh, so this is not giving the high vacuum, but you will see that the other pumps simply cannot uh, work at the atmospheric pressure, so first you have to evacuate to a low pressure, but not ultra high vacuum pressure, and then you can switch on your uh, other pumps. Uh, the principle is quite easy. Uh, there is a rotor that's uh, uh, moving inside this uh, eccentric chamber and it just takes some vapors, compresses them and, uh, and exhausts them. Uh, the drawback of this is uh, that everything is in oil, so nowadays they are, try they are usually switching to a kind of dry scroll pumps. The oil diffusion pump and troll pump, pump are actually pumps that can achieve quite a high vacuum. The oil diffusion pump works the way that uh, here you have a heater and the oil reservoir and the oil is heated up that it evaporates and uh, it speeds up and condensates on these uh, metal plates. And where there is a very high velocity of the oil from the Bernoulli equation you know that there is a high velocity, there is a low pressure, so actually it's taking all the particles by this low pressure down here where it's pumped out by the backing pump. Uh, these oil diffusion pumps are nice because they are not vibrating extremely. Uh, there is some kind of vibration and they are usually silent. Whereas turbo molecular pump is a mechanical pump, but uh, it has an advantage that it's a dry pump. It's uh, not using any oil for the pumping. So you have uh, here you have a set of rotors and stators. Whereas you can see that the stage difference in between rotor and stator is, is gradually decreasing, and this is how it actually compresses the gases. This you can think about of this turbo molecular pump as a compressor that actually is rising the pressure here, but therefore it's lowering the pressure here. So it's getting out the air just to be able to compress it and put it uh, to this part, where uh, actually is the uh, in outlet for the backing pump. This is a mechanical part that spins very really fast at around 100,000 RPM, but uh, it's a very robust system and can achieve very high vacuum. To get an ultra high vacuum, we use IGPs, ion getter pumps. The ion getter pump is a pump that can start only from a high vacuum. It cannot start from an ambient pressure, it cannot start from, from medium vacuum. It all already needs a high vacuum. Why? Because an ion getter pump is nothing else, just uh, two charged plates. One is charged to positive charge, uh, sorry, negative charge, and the other one to positive charge. And what happens is when there are gas ions that are ionized, these are getting trapped by these plates. Uh, so these plates gradually build up uh, the residues of these gases, 
uh, on the surface. So after a while, you need a while you need to replace these uh, iron getter pumps. Uh, a complete vacuum system of microscope is quite uh, um, quite complex, I would say. So this is just the schematics of I think it's the F20 microscope, where you have a backing pump, a rotary pump. And you see that this backing pump is actually pre-vacuating every, every line, whereas here everywhere you have valves that you can switch on and off, because the evacuation of the microscope works uh, like they are isolated chambers. So here is one chamber, here is another chamber, here is another chamber, and you are gradually evacuating all the chambers, and when you are reaching a certain pressure in the chamber, then you are switching out, for example, a turbo molecular pump. You find out that you have a pressure enough to switch off this turbo molecular pump, and you are again gradually lowering the pressure in this uh, in this chamber. Then you can open this valve. You lower the uh, pressure in this chamber as well, and then you can switch on, for example, the IGP, the ion getter pump one, which gives you an extra uh, uh, ultra high vacuum. This, uh, just for information, this is the gun. This is the column with the uh, uh, condenser lens, here's where the sample comes in, and here's your detector. Uh, to make uh, these peaks of, uh, of the vacuum uh, lower when something happens, here is a tank that is pre-vacuated and works like a buffer. So this is just a large uh, volume of vacuum that's, uh, that's backing up all, all these parts. If they're excellent, uh, there will be some leakage, so the, uh, the pressure is not rising extremely fast. Now, we finished with our electron microscope buildup, and we are almost by the end of our presentation. So it's up to you if you want to follow with the sample preparation. That's around uh, four or five slides, or I should uh, give up and fall by next time. So uh, somebody can unmute and tell me. Okay, everybody is calm, so you are actually eager to hear how the sample preparation works. That's great. So this will be fast. Uh, uh, this will be give us some extra ten minutes. Hope you are not sleeping yet, guys. So the sample preparation. Uh, the first step of every sample preparation for for NMR, for X-ray crystallography, for cryo microscopy starts with your sample. The sample itself is the molecule, is the complex, and this is the most difficult part to do. So uh, I'm not going to uh, in depth how to prepare the perfect sample because this will depend really on your sample, whether you are uh, isolating a ribosome, you are isolating some spliceosome or other complexes, you will need to find the most proper method how to get it. Yeah, so, so this part, the preparation of the perfect sample, is really the hardest one. From this point, everything is really smooth, well, almost. So the next, uh, next step will be vitrification. The vitrification is embedding our sample into vitreous eyes, and then we can check it on the microscope. However, sometimes we need to store our sample. And here it is very important that all the time from the vitrification process, when we vitrified our sample, we have to keep our sample at a near nitrogen, uh, near liquid nitrogen uh, temperature to prevent the devitrification. Whereas once the sample was devitrified, it cannot be vitrified again. So it, it's permanently damaged and, and degraded. Well, uh, I don't know how many of you have already seen a, a Transmission electron microscope and how it works, but in transmission electron microscopy, you are usually using copper grids of 3 millimeter diameter and they have some kind of grating or grid on them. This grid has a spacing of 100 micrometers or 5 or 200 micrometers, it depends on the mesh. However, this, uh, these holes are extremely large for the biological complexes, therefore, we need to cover them with a layer of carbon, for example. Uh, we can uh, carbon coat them with uh, with a carbon that has no holes at all. This is not suitable for character microscopy because we don't want to have uh, ice on thick layer of carbon. Therefore, we can use so-called lacy carbon. This carbon has uh, kind of bubbles of air that, that cause the, the car carbon to make this lacy pattern where all the holes are irregular. 
but actually uh, when the sample freezes here it will create uh, places with uh, uh, with vitrified ice that actually has no carbon inside. Uh, the most used one nowadays is a called quantifoil carbon or a holy carbon where you have a carbon film which is perforated evenly by holes and these holes you can choose a spacing uh, even the shape of the holes which uh, must not be circular they can be hexagonal as well and uh, where you are imaging is actually inside the holes so you are not uh, imaging on the carbon side carbon is just a support film and inside the holes you are acquiring your image the most fancy ones are uh, actually when you are using instead of carbon uh, gold this is again a holy gold layer uh, this is very nice uh, it gives some improved stability however are not routinely used only for very high resolution samples so the sample pre preparation the vitrification process this was awarded uh, by Nobel Prize for Jacques Dubochet because it's so um, excellent method actually what's happening here uh, your goal is to embed your uh, sample in ice that has no crystals because what we want to have, we want to have a uniform background that has no structure. If there's a crystal, we know from crystallography that it has always some structure. So uh, if we can froze the ice or froze the water fast enough to prevent ordering of the molecules, then we can make an amorphous ice, which is also called vitreous ice. Jacques Dubochet find out that uh, actual liquid nitrogen is no way to go because uh, uh, liquid nitrogen has very low uh, heat capacity instead of that he used liquid ethane and liquid ethane uh, can freeze uh, at a rate of maybe thousand decrease of thousand degrees celsius per second so in one second you you decrease uh, your temperature by thousand degrees which is actually you know a nonsense because the uh, the actually the lowest temperature is uh, less than thousand degrees but actually this is the rate uh, how fast this vitrification is uh, is going to happen. This is uh, done simply by applying your sample to, to the grid. You are holding it with some tweezers. Then you blot off the majority of your sample. You just leave a very thin film on your on your grid and plunge it into liquid ethane. What you will get is that in the holes that you've seen on the previous slide, there will be a carbon support. And inside the hole, you will have your biomolecules embedded in vitreous ice. It is like having them in, in glass. <clears throat> the vitrification instrument, this is just to show you how it really looks like. So uh, not, nowadays we have an automatized instrument that you have a tweezer, here's your grid, you uh, have a blotting papers, it uh, blots away the, uh, the extra liquid and plunges it into liquid ether. So uh, there are some uh, drawbacks of this sample preparation. <clears throat> that might be improved and there are many people working on that to improve it. One of this is that uh, here we are applying 4 microliters of uh, solution and 99.9% .9 of the solution is blotted out by the filter paper before uh, freezing. This is really needed because you want a really thin layer of uh, vitreous ice. So if this won't be blotted out then you simply would have a thicker ice here. The problem is that if you apply uh, less than four microliters, then actually your process is not working or it's working worse. So actually you cannot simply just decrease the amount of, of sample to, uh, to save it. Sometimes you really need to apply these four microliters and this is a kind of waste of sample. Uh, then, uh, for example, liquid ethane is uh, uh, also getting contaminated sometimes. Uh, you need to take care of it, uh, not to get it contaminated, because then the contamination will stack, to stick to your uh, to your sample. And the last thing is that it might happen that your molecules get to the surface of this uh, uh, of this ice, and when it contacts, uh, get in contact with the air, it gets deformed, and it gets deformed uh, majorly. So it it will destruct your your structure. It was shown that maybe 80% uh, of the particles is actually very close, uh, if not at, at the air uh, water interface, and this is something that we want to avoid. Therefore, there are new devices that try to fight this. This is just for your information. Up to date, I, I haven't seen 
any of this uh, device in the practice. This, this, is, this is just to let you know that there are few uh, things that they are trying to improve. For example, they try to decrease the uh, amount of the sample by applying it on uh, uh, on an uh, ultrasonic transducer. Then switching on the transducer will make a spray that's spraying on the grid and then they are plunging the grid into uh, liquid aten. The other way is the inject uh, uh, technology. This is very similar to if you have a uh, inject printer at home that's injecting uh, the ink on your paper that can produce a very small drops so actually this uh, this is injecting your sample in a very small drops all over your grid and then this grid is uh, a frozen liquid thing or you just take a very thin tip and dip it into your sample and just write a nice path over your grid which is actually uh, coated by uh, by holy carbon. This, uh, this is maybe one of these or all of these are the future of sample preparation. Uh, we will see. So uh, this is the end of this lecture. What we have learned, uh, we see that cryolim is not anymore a complementary method for the structural biology. Uh, we've seen the main principles of the optic pulse of TM, how uh, the detection devices work, how the non-optic pulse work, and a little bit of sample preparation. Uh, this is the end. I will be happy to answer all your questions, and I hope that there will be many of these questions. So feel free to unmute your microphone and ask for questions. Can you hear me? It's Susanna. Yes. So I have a question about these pivot points. Uh, I saw that you draw a point in the middle of the two condensers. Yes. You know, the, in the middle, yes. And I just don't understand exactly if it's something like an imaginary point. Not and really. you know that you so the pivot point itself is is just a point uh, that around these deflectors will work. This uh, red point is not extremely representing it. This is just a, okay. is a tech, uh, just to memorize it that there's a pivot point. Pivot point uh, itself is a point uh, at around which something is turning around. That's why I, I showed it as a as a red dot there. But uh, uh, in fact, the pivot point in case of these deflector coils is just uh, a function that sets the strength of the upper and lower deflection coils to uh, either get a beam tilt or a beam shift. Mm -hmm. So you basically, not, you are not determining it or anything, it's just something like a construct, how you understand what you are yes. doing basically. And what yeah. you are actually doing is adapting the strengths of the two. Exactly. Uh, Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So, okay, uh, the next time we will uh, talk about image formation. Uh, we will start a little bit with theory of uh, Fourier transformation. I, I think many people are really interested how the, the Fourier space works, how the Fourier transformation works, how we can live in the reciprocal space as well as we will uh, explain what's the point spread function, how it connects to the contrast transfer function, and how we can make some uh, CTF corrections, contrast transfer function corrections. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and see you next time.